Malachi's back, baby! We are here with a man that I can easily pronounce his last name. Uh, <laughs> Tony Lyons. Uh, I'm not <laughs> Tony Tony has been uh, I call Tony um, the uh, Bobby Fisher of visual effects because he just disappeared out of nowhere after sh revealing to us this in incredible workflow of uh, green screen and keying and so forth and has been implemented in at least the studios that I have I've worked for which are not many but um, they are but um, Tony has got an extensive history. He is, he is now in Munich, Germany, and I'll allow, I'll allow him to give himself an introduction. So, Tony. Um, yeah, I went to Full Sail University in 2009, graduated, moved over to Los Angeles, uh, started interning at Zoic um, for free, a uh, classic American um, free internship. Um, then I got a job, um, a small place, Gradient Effects, got a job at Luma, that's when I started getting into films, which uh, was pretty cool early on. But I was doing Roto Paint there for like two years. Um, left that to become a, a compositor at Ingenuity Studios, which is a small commercial place um, in Hollywood. Uh, after that, I really wanted to become uh, international. I always wanted to live in London. So I thought the best way to do that was to go outside of the U.S. So I started applying outside, just desperately seeing... Uh, where I could go. Um, I went to, well, I got an, uh, an offer from, from China, from Shanghai, uh, Pixamondo. And at the time, uh, I w I'd only been a compositor for one year. And I said, yeah, well, I'll take anything, basically. And uh, they were doing Star Trek Into Darkness at the time. And I thought it was a great opportunity. Um, it was good pay. Um, they were offering me a mid-compositor position. Um, on Star Trek, and I was like, great, this is, this is everything I need. So I went over there, and that was really eye-opening. And after that, I just started um, becoming, yeah, more international. Well, I went to Vancouver at MPC uh, the next year. I came back to Los Angeles um, and got a, jo a steady job at Framestore Los Angeles for about two years, which was uh, was when I started making all the, all the videos about keying um, during this kind of like steady period. And uh, then after that, I went to, to London for about a year and a half, and then I, I left that, went to Singapore, traveled for a bit, got a job in Sydney, Australia at um, uh, Elora, uh, which switched to Method Studios, and, uh, and now, after a year and a half of that, I'm in, back in Europe in Munich, Germany at Trickster, so that's where I am currently, Munich. So you just finished up on Captain Marvel as of today. Uh, the film has been, I think, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, as of today, as of this morning, the film has been released, so we're allowed to kind of chat about it and so forth. And uh, yeah. we got a million things, a million questions I personally would like to ask you, but I want to not be selfish and definitely allow for a lot of other people the, the questions that they've been asking and so forth. And just sure. also for those listening, um, I have uh, links at the bottom for future guests' questions. I have this new Tech Talk and Real Talk, which we're going to actually review people's reels and so forth. Um, so far, no one has submitted a reel yet, so we don't have any reels. But there is there was some tech questions that have already popped up, so I think that'll definitely benefit everybody. Um, but uh, getting back to you, Tony, I mean, uh, uh, the reality is, is there's uh, as we were talking about earlier there's not a lot of people in the industry who have the time i should say that's probably a better word for it um yeah. or maybe even the desire or maybe even the talent to teach uh the the tricks that they've learned in the industry and throw it up on youtube for free and you have been nice enough to do that and your name is known wherever i go they know tony lyons tony <laughs> lyons tony lyons which is like <laughs> We're a small, I still think we're still a small community as a VFX worldwide even, but we all sort of know everything. It's weird because I was stopped in the street uh, and they were like, hey, you're a mascotic. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. and it's a small it, world. It's a small world. Yeah, it's a real small world. It's, it's really crazy. But I mean, if you were to go on YouTube, you'd be hard pressed to find really good nuke training for free. If it wasn't, you know, you can get it through paid sources and so forth. Um, some of the websites I always, you know, in regards to compositing, Effects PhD, 
But even yep. FX PhD seems like there there doesn't seem there seems to be a stop of to uh, training. And I keep seeing everyone in their reels. They're all using the same clips from FX PhD <laughs> yeah. as artists, as beginner artists. But um, mm-hmm. we, I think. To start off, before we even get into your immense career and the current film you just finished, the education system, um, yep. I guess we could start with your history when you first started out, which was uh, Full Sail, which is exactly where um, Richard uh, went to. Yeah. So if you can give just a background on that, you know. Yeah, I, I took the computer animation degree. Uh, I started in 2007 and I graduated. It was a two-year degree, but um, it was a bachelor's program. And so... It's I think it's twenty twenty one months straight, no breaks, forty hours a week. You get um, four hours of lectures, and then you do four hours of lab, um, and then that's not even including the the homework that they'd give you and the weekends that you'd have to come into the labs to work on the computers because you know most of us didn't have computers uh, at home. Um, there was no dorms or anything, so you kind of had to get your own apartment and everything. Um, Florida is great. Full sail I think was was great. Um, as Hugo mentioned, you get what you what you put into it. Um, so, yeah, the, the potential was there to to succeed. And um, as I was mentioning to you earlier, uh, the, the there's a lot of benefits to to going to university um, outside of learning. And uh, two of them would be um, the network that you build, um, the people that you build, even ten years later. I'm still really, really good friends with um, a lot of the people that I went to school with, um, and we're, we're always talking, and uh, and they're in the industry too, and so we, we communicate, we help each other out, um, even even ten years down the line. So th- th- those core people that you meet when you when you're learning can be really invaluable later on. And the second thing would be um, if you do plan on um, traveling with your career and working in different countries. Um, I think a bachelor's degree is often in the visa requirements of many of these countries. So even that by itself, I mean, um, is pretty is pretty valuable um, if it'll help you um, a- ahead of somebody else that maybe doesn't have a bachelor's because of the visa process or something like that. That can be pretty valuable as well. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know that um, that, that the the requirement for a bachelor's. So you're like, you know, if, if ILM were to call you tomorrow, like, come on over, and, you got, and they'd be like, got your, got your, uh, you know, you got everything in order, you got your passport, yeah, you got a bachelor's. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it depends on the country, and some countries are more mm-hmm. strict than others. Like the UK is famously very strict. Um, I think other countries might be more relaxed. Uh, I think there are programs of like um, five years in your industry would would um, kind of translate over into a bachelor's. And uh, as compositors, we're oftentimes on countries' uh, work shortage lists, um, like skilled labor. And so we actually, there, there actually are listings in, in countries that they're able to make exceptions for us um, because we're, we're like very technical careers that I guess um, bring a lot of profit to the country. And, and so we can often get visas where maybe somebody else well, if you're like a barista or something maybe you wouldn't be able to to slip into the the visa um uh as as much as a vfx worker so that's that's really useful do you find i just curious and you don't have to go obviously at numbers but is there a very is there a heavy contrast in rate difference between working in germany working in shanghai working in london working in LA? The, to the point where you're like, okay, I'm going to be broke this month. <laughs> and then when I'm over um, here, I'll be living it up, you know. Yes. Um, yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, different countries have different different wages. Um, I would say, in my experience, I would say that uh, Los Angeles probably pays the most of, of anywhere on Earth, probably, um, with the exception maybe of Australia and New Zealand. And that is... That is pretty much strictly because um, of the overtime laws. Uh, Vancouver might be pretty close. I'm not sure because they also have some overtime laws. Um, but I, I would say um, you're at a disadvantage when you go to some of the other countries because they simply because they don't pay overtime. Um, so you're not getting paid. You're only getting paid your base salary and not um, anything extra. So uh, I mean, you could even say New York because I think they pay strictly day rates. Um, if, if you're working freelance on commercials, you might just be getting day rates, so it might you might not be getting any, any overtime as well. But um, 
I think there is certainly a, like a list of of rates and countries. Um, yeah, it, it, there's also living wages, um, like living living expenses and stuff. Like London is famous, so they don't pay that much, and it's very expensive to live there. So you could be making the same in London as you would in Singapore or China, but obviously living well, Singapore may be as expensive as London, but if you're living in China or India, um, if you're making the same as you're making in London, you're going to be living a lot better simply because um, the housing is, is so much cheaper. So, so yeah, there's all things to take into consideration, I think. I'm looking at a picture. Can you still see my share screen or no? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I got a, uh, we got a conspiracy theory going on here. This is in the middle of Munich here. This is Trickster. Uh, where are you? Are you still there? Are you pretty much transitioning to Sweden? You mentioned, or are you just taking a vacation? No, 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 no. Um, I'm, I'm still a trickster. Um, I am. Uh, oh, I just signed a year contract with them, so I'll be there for the next, um, for the next year, hopefully. And uh, yeah, that's actually what the building looks like. It's that's all blurry like that. No. They, just don't, they want us. They don't want to see Captain Marvel going on in the window. I'm guessing. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, it might be like an NDA thing. I'm not actually sure why it looks like that. I have no idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe I should do some other searches of other studios and see if they got theirs blocked off. <laughs> Go <laughs> down uh, Santa Monica and see if every single building has this. Um, yeah. So, what is it like? I mean, do you have to? Did you have to know German before going to Trickster to talk to your fellow um, coworkers? No, no. Um, it's it's a very international market. So we work we work in English. I think you're gonna probably work in English um, in visual effects, no matter where you go, with the exception of a few countries. Um, because everyone's not German where I'm working. I mean, you got people from Spain and Italy and um, Brazil and South America and everything, uh, and pe people are going to work in English, and they're very comfortable. And uh, Germany is very, um, they know English very well, especially the younger generation. So um, you can get by um, in places like Munich and Berlin and stuff. Uh, it's it's pretty easy. Um, not saying that you shouldn't learn it. I'm, I'm going to start start learning it this year. Um, pick it up. Um, it's obviously very, very difficult. I've heard language. English is the hardest language to learn. Is, that, uh, is there uh, any uh, credence to that? Man, it's probably, probably harder for... It depends on where you're coming from, I suppose. I don't know. I'm not sure. Because I know, like, even just talking to... Um, uh, talking to you, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, gosh, here I go again with my name problem. <laughs> I just interviewed this kid uh, in Munich, Germany. Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, but anyway, uh, just speaking English. I mean, everyone you talk to, it's like, oh, they speak English. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing somebody from Skybox uh, VFX uh, tomorrow uh, from India and speak English. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's very interesting that it seems like English is the second language around the world here, and it, mm -hmm. it goes good for us uh, for us Yanks, you know. Yeah, but, they uh, they certainly um, they understand Americans better than um, other English speakers. I, I I believe it's because of um, the media that we put out, like um, songs, mu music, like interviews and um, podcasts and stuff. Um, so uh, I always get, com no matter where I am in the world, I always get complimented that they can understand me finally, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, I never, you, you don't see that as an American. Um, like when you're in America, you don't expect, you, you expect everybody to have difficulty understanding you, but that is one advantage, I guess, of being an American. Um, even though we don't tend to know other languages, at least people can understand us, which is kind of cool. So, so um, Trickster, what's it like working there? Uh, I really like it. Um, it's a pretty small place. Uh, it's probably about 100 people like total in the office. Um, the comp team probably got as big as 20 to 30 people, somewhere around there. It obviously like scaled um, as we approached Crunch. We needed more people and everything. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. Um, like most studios in, in the industry, you know, there's like Beer Friday. Um, it's a, there's a big sense of like community. Everyone was willing to share there. Um, it was a great, I learned a ton when I was there, um, which, which you don't always do in, in some studios. Like sometimes the bigger studios, you don't learn as much because, um, either you're not always next to, to the, the right people, um, maybe they're in different departments or something. Like shove all the pain people in the corner. All right, slaves get yeah. to work, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, some places, um, you know, they'll, they'll, you'll be sitting next to like animators or something. Um, but but huh. 
uh, most of the time you'll you'll sit in like a comp floor um, with other compers. I think, um, but it, it was just a, a great team. I had a lot of fun there. I was I'm very happy to stay. So, um, but I think I think it's important to note that um, every every company is, is very subjective to the person that's working there. Um, you have to find what works for you. Um, like the same two people could think the company sucks or the company was the greatest thing in the world and they could be working at the same time, the same team. But often it, it changes like per year, per team, per project, per company, per location. So you can't, you can't ever say like one company is, is absolutely terrible and one company is absolutely the best. Um, it's, it's not like a movie subjective. studio where the management changes every five minutes, is it? I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, or or is that not true? Like at a VFX studio, I don't think it's that bad. Well, well, you can uh, <laughs> you can be like uh, tossed around from from project to project, and uh, those projects. Um, it depends on how big the studio is, but at a bigger studio, those projects are run by different producers and uh, different different coordinators and different soups, um, comp soups and VFX soups. So you could be at the same studio. This, ha- this happened to me at, um, in, in Method uh, or Alora in Sydney. Like, um, you can be on, on one side of the studio on a different team, and, uh, and then the next project you're like on another side of the studio, and it feels like, a to- it feels like you entered another studio because maybe you're using a slightly, slightly different pipeline because... Um, you know, the comp soup wanted to use this pipeline instead or this technique or the coordinators wanted to schedule the dailies in this time. So um, it can feel quite different even if you're at the same place, um, project to project. Um, so that, that, all that factors into whether or not you like a place. And, and it's really ultimately it's up to you um, if you like a place or not and whether or not you want to stay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm looking at your IMDb here. Actually, let's go to your. Uh, you have a really awesome website with a very with the most impressive resume, done oh, in Photoshop, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of gives you this. Uh, you know, kind of really gives you a bird's eye view of your career, uh, because it just not only it's not like IMDb where it just shows your actual the the movies you worked on, but it shows what studio and obviously you've mentioned before that you've put a little flag there, so what country you were in. Well, um, I thought maybe that would be <clears throat> help. <laughs> For any of you at, uh, out there, creativelions.com, as you can see here, and he has a, a really awesome website. And, of course, being successful in the industry, and I think a lot of that success, besides being ridiculously talented, but also being a giver, being somebody that actually took the time. No one told Tony to throw up you know, a bunch of tutorials on the uh, green screen. And I don't think there's anybody in the world that – isn't appreciative of what you did, you know, and I, I, I bumped into, I, I keep bringing back uh, one of my old bosses when I worked at NetherRealm Studios, you know, he turned to me and he just goes, he, again, he just said, man, nobody cares what movies I worked on or what video games I worked on. What they care about is what I did for them, what I helped them. That's what they're going to remember me for. They're not going to remember me for what movie I worked on, what video game. I've, I've had video games where I've gone into the 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 bargain bin and I dug deep and I found a video game I worked on. I'm like, wow, that was three years of my life. You know, what? Where is that now? You talk to kids today; they're like, "I don't know what video game you're talking about." You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially things like commercials. Like you see a commercial once and you forget about it. <laughs> but uh, not, not saying that working in commercials is bad. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's you're right. I think. Um, it. I mean, I guess that's that. That would be part of the reason why uh, I did the the tutorials. Is kind of like I want to give back, and maybe also like I, I wanted. Like when I when I first started, you know, I had people. Um, I think he was mentioned before, like Ryan Weaver, um, the guy that did the um, lightsaber battle and stuff. When I was a kid, he he was like my inspiration, and Andrew Kramer, of course, um, <laughs> Kramer, and, some, and Steve Wright, and all these people. Steve and, Wright, um, the Godfather. I want to interview him. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, and you know, I'm not saying I, I was trying to be uh, somebody like that, but I certainly, you look at them and you're like, wow, I want to give back as much as these people try to give back and um and yeah at a certain point um yeah i i was uh, frustrated with the lack of i guess good it was always like 101 videos and stuff and and i think i was frustrated because i was somebody that had trouble with keying when i first started out when i was becoming a compositor and uh and i desperately was searching for different keying videos and you know i thankfully I gathered a bunch of stuff i got um i got experience in doing it and 
you know, would slowly learn over time, like, oh, that, that works, that works, and, and, and everything. And, and then I wanted to, I wanted to share it with people because as sort of kind of as a, a stick it to the man or something, well, if nobody else is going to do it, I'll, I'll do it or something. Um, well, you know, the question I have to ask you, you've worked at pretty much every major VFX house in the world, I would say. Uh, the question well, I have is like, the tools you're dealing with over there, I'm sure they have preset tools. And like, all right, you know, IBK, Gizmo, IBK, Color. Uh, hey, we got our own key here. It takes care of all that nonsense you have to deal with here. Just throw this thing on, it'll automatically key it. I mean, do you, how much of that is the tool sets? Like, I know ILM has an extensive list of tools that you just like, yeah. boop, and pop it up and it's there and make things quicker, cheaper, faster. How much of a dramatic difference in what you know at a different each in a different studio versus the atypical default tools that you know of even in Nukipedia compared to what the mm-hmm. tools that you see within these studios what they're using to f- you know get things moving faster how how big of a contrast is that and is that sort of a detriment to you know newcomers who just like we were talking about before, Richard was saying, we need a crap load of artists, but we need a crap load of artists with a crap load of experience in their brains. We can't have all yeah. these kids stepping out of these schools where they're like, I, I know uh, K-Light, you know, and you're like, no, 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 I need you to know how to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And you're like, well, I never did that before, not in school, you know. Yeah. So your opinions? Um, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I think I think uh, leaning too much on proprietary tools at places um, – can can be good for the place. Um, there's certainly learning curves with um, what what tools that company has decided are, are really good tools. Like every company's got their own like exponential blur or something. Um, but as far as keying, um, they, yeah, they kind of leave you to do it whatever you know how to do. Um, I, I there are, there are some um, some TV shows that I know of that they had like this ultimate like plug and play sort of thing where you plug everything in and kind of like worked because it was, I think with TV, they needed to do things really fast, but uh, I haven't really encountered that with, with any of the major studios. Like they don't, they don't specifically say, Oh, you have to use, um, key light or something. Um, and, and so that, yeah. So, but if you lean too much on a proprietary tool, when you go to the next place, you might not have that tool. So I think it's always really good to know how to do things in vanilla nuke like if you if you just had nuke um can you do the same thing without that fancy tool um or that fancy node because some companies don't want you to bring in tools and other companies um you know they don't they have limited internet access and stuff and or maybe it's unapproved or whatever so i think it all depends on the place but but having those like core skills of like this is how you can still get away with it maybe it makes your life easier but like you, you should know how to do it um and any nuke like uh that you that you can so that's what I would say. Yeah, the um, you seem like a pretty chill dude. I mean, do you see the uh, see pressure make people crack at all? I mean, do you see, <laughs> definitely, I mean, definitely. <laughs> yeah, like um, even someone that would be almost a mild manner composite, like but enough of this, you know, or just like oh my gosh, these hours, you know. I mean, everybody cracks, you know. Everybody, everybody has a breaking point, and uh, I commend the people that don't. They're, they're saints. Um, I think looking up stoicism is probably pretty helpful uh, to whoever wants to. Yeah, but the, the deadlines, you know, I mean, not only are you stressed, but your coordinator might be stressed and your supervisor might be stressed. And, um, and the, the, I mean, it's like a, you know, taking time bomb or something, you know, it's like, but, but I think everybody knows that, you know, um, and it's, you definitely don't want to be a dick. Um, you don't want to like blow up and, smash your keyboard or something like that like that's that's a big no-no but um you know it's it's you have to be respectful you have to know that like everyone's trying their best you're part of a team right like you're you're all trying to accomplish the same goal you're always you're always trying to get the shot out of the door and uh you know part of your job as a compositor is to offer up so the like the quick solutions like oh actually well let's not send that back to cg let me give me like an hour and i can fiddle around with it and after the hour if it doesn't work then yeah send it back to cg like like there's stuff like that can def- can diffuse stressful situations also trying to give people really accurate estimates of time like uh once you do it more often you'll get you'll get better at at knowing how long something will take you and uh try try not to lie about it like don't 
Like the worst thing you can do, I think, is if, if you know something's going to take six hours and you say, yeah, it's going to take me two hours, and they come back two hours later, and you're like, yeah, uh, it's actually going to take me six, um, I think people get pretty frustrated with that type of stuff. So it's it's best to to overshoot, to be like, yeah, maybe it'll take me eight. It'll take me six on a, if everything goes perfectly, but maybe it'll take me eight. Um, if nothing, if something yeah, goes wrong. I always wrong. add two hours. It's, I remember working over at another home. You'd have like some guy come in and like, oh, 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 yeah, it's going to be, I looked at my boss who shared an office with me and he was like, yeah, no, I got a week. I'm like, that only will take us two days. He's like, oh, a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, okay. So you, you, don't start... add, you don't add too much time because uh, then they're going to think you're really oh, yeah. bad. So oh, yeah. you, have to be, you, have to, you have to be accurate with, with what you're doing. Have you experienced any people that have walked in there maybe even at an intern level or a junior level and you're like, and they're like, uh, listen, son, you got to go, you know, is that just, uh, do people just eventually figure it out? I mean, obviously they don't get in the door unless you guys have really <clears throat> at least look at a competent reel where you've established, okay, I think I could put this guy to task and he will not be crying back to me as a basket case, you know, like, yeah, oh, I do um, this. not just, not just juniors. I think, uh, I've seen a lot of seniors, um, get, put into that into that um unfortunate predicament um i think what happens a lot is is um people can people can start snowballing their career and they they can uh you once you get one credit you can get the next credit and once you get you know five huge movies um within like a year or two then any place will probably hire you especially if you worked at a couple studios and then um and then there's no way of like you can kind of get away with a lot. You can kind of like be snowball on your career, and and then and then you can charge senior rates. And uh, I think the seniors have it worse um, because if you find out a junior is not so good, at least you can train them. If you find out that senior with the highest rate possible is not so good, then then the studio is losing a lot of money, and he's more likely to go, um, um, which is unfortunate. But so I think that that puts an interesting. Um, dynamic in, in how you apply to places because you need to catch the recruiter's eye with with your CV and your and your IMDB and stuff and so that'll catch the recruiter's eye but then they'll hand you over to the, the um, VFX suit or comp suit and I think you were mentioning this they're, they're very precise so there's like two there's like two levels that you need to get through and the reason why they're so picky maybe um, at your reels and stuff is, is so they can really quiz you on whether or not you know it or, or if you're just somebody who's you know snuck by and you get that one imdb credit and the next imdb credit and you actually don't know what you're doing and but somehow you're a senior thing so and, and as a senior or as a mid you also have to prove that you're not one of these um types of people so you want to you want to know your stuff when you get interviewed um you you want to be able to give them technical examples of what you did and uh what you why it's on your reel like wh why is it special from other things why is it in the beginning of your reel stuff like that so i've had some really weird interviews at some studios i mostly back in the day before i was in vfx you'd sit down and i had this i remember having this one interview and the interviewer was like which mat are you and i'm like the mat that wants the job <laughs> <laughs> the right one <laughs> yeah it's like like what a question to ask an interviewer you know and one, one other guy uh he would tell me about his thyroid like he's like let me tell you about my thyroid issues and i'm like what I'm like, yeah. this, this is the world of mom and popper studios here in chicago not necessarily this i don't think anybody that's worked at a major studio is like i never heard somebody talk you know but um, yeah. when you're dealing with the mom and popper uh, land, which is usually, and I'm dealing with somebody right now, he's not like this, but um, dealing with somebody that did work for a, a major studio here in Chicago, and he went off and branched to make his own studio. So mm -hmm. he's contracting me through for freelance right now for a TV commercial spot uh, right now. So <laughs> it's sort of, um, and oddly enough, it's not compositing. It's actually... Uh, a substance painter, substance designer. It seems to be a big demand for that all of a sudden. And I'm like, okay. So I did some substance painter, oh, you cool. know, training, and now everyone's. I, I get all these calls like, hey, you know substance? I'm like, yeah. Uh, and it's just like, well, I got this virtual reality movie. And I need a. I need all of Brooklyn. I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So anyway, back to you, sir. Uh, Zoic Studios. Uh, that was your. Was you started out as an intern there? Yes. Um... Yeah, that was a that was a fun place. They worked on mostly TVs, TV shows, um, and uh, that was that was really fun. We 
I had kind of, uh, I'm, so I graduated in 2009 with, um, uh, I had made some really good friends that were also compositors, um, Rob Price and Chase Pickle. And uh, we all graduated together and I think we were just hanging out one day and we we're like, yeah, what if we all just moved to, to L.A. together? So we, we kind of moved to L.A., we banded our money together, we got an apartment and everything just to like stick it out. And uh, w- I think we had a, we knew somebody there, but th- they, have, they had an internship uh, program back in the day that you could apply for and uh, we all applied and we all got it and so that was a really fun time we just uh we're just there all three of us was that, in the shake, ironically, was that shake days or is that nuke days the so day. the, i think around 2009 2010 was a kind of a big transition period uh, from shake to nuke so um that was probably it was nuke um but we all got a job all three of us um we had this connection at a studio and they needed um they needed more people to work a night shift um, job at. It was um, Gradient Studios. They needed some night shift workers that were really junior. And so we had a connection there, and they got all three of us the job at once. And it was our first job, so that would, so that was night shift, and we were doing the internship at the same time. Oh, my gosh. And so, so we would... So you were, you were officially on the freight train having got off from that we, moment on. We... Uh, we got really lucky, and uh, so a lot of us thought, like, well, we don't want to lose this internship, but we want to get this experience. But it's a night shift, so that means we can do the internship during the day, drive over to the studio at night, work all night, get four hours of sleep, and then go back and do the internship for o- over, like, a period of two weeks, three weeks. And so we just did that, all three of us. And so we're, oh <laughs> we were, like, gosh. sleeping in our cars in the, in the parking lot and stuff uh, I mean, it, it sounds horrible, but uh, at the time, you know, Hugo, I mean, Hugo back, has a book for you about sleep. I'm just let you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, he's, he's probably right about that. But, but you know, I think willing, to, you need to be willing to to break some eggs. You know, you need to be willing to to do whatever it takes. Like, you don't want to lose the internship, and you and you don't want to lose this opportunity. So, if you have to do both, then you have to do both. Um, I, so, in and in, in coming from that, um. One of us ended up staying at this at this place, uh, Gradient Effects. Um, one of us went on to, uh, after the internship at Zoic, stay at Zoic, and then I ended up um, getting a job at Luma Luma Pictures. And so, you know, that that was all three of us kind of diverged, but we all started at the same place. So, I mean, the opportunities are there. Um, what you, was the night something. shift hours, if you don't mind me asking for that? I've never seen that ever since then, but okay. yeah, basically... Basically, the computers are idle idle at night, so we came in and we would just work all night. Like we'd work from like uh, nine o'clock until five in the morning or well, something must like have been that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that. That's not a normal. Would you go thing, to like a not. late night diner for lunch or whatever? Um, yeah, something. We just brought our lunch or something. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that was very odd. I, I wouldn't. Say, that's not very normal. I've never done that again. Um, so, so Luma Pictures, we got the Avengers. Underworld 4, In Time, Captain America, The First Avenger, X-Men First Class, Fright Night, Thor, True Grit, and The Green Hornet. I was all roto paint um, in the roto paint department for that, which, um, which was good. I mean, um, I, think, I think people were mentioning that that, does, that avenue doesn't exist anymore. And if that's true, that's kind of sad because, I mean, I was, I was a strong believer that like, getting those fundamentals and those building blocks to... Being a strong compositor, well, like, like you, sh- you should know how to paint and you should know how to roto. And uh, if uh, if you can make it far without knowing those things, then eventually one day you'll have to do it. And then it's not going to be a pretty day when they find out you can't do that. Um, but you know, people do it. I mean, if, if you can leap leapfrog into mid comp right away, it's no problem. Um, but but uh, for me, I, I still use all all those kind of techniques. So just on this Captain Marvel movie, I mean, depending on how big the studio is, they don't always have a roto team or a prep team, and they don't always outsource it. So, I mean, a lot of times you'll you'll just have to do uh, a prep or paint um, by yourself um, without any help. So, so I think it is really important to know how to do that. And so you should always look at it like this is a, this is a skill set that I'm going to need later. So. It's it's good that I'm working it out. Like don't don't be too discouraged. Like um, I would say after you learn, like once you start getting bored of paint because you just kind of like can do anything 
pretty much you, you've seen it all kind of thing mm-hmm. then it's time to move on for sure and you, you want to move on from that as fast as you can but but don't be discouraged um look at it as, as an opportunity to really really learn everything about those two things well another avenue is like what's that stereo stereo something it's a vf it's a specific stereo conversion house in la i believe is that an avenue to kind of go into that category of paint i, I hear a lot of compositors like i ain't doing that stereo crap you know, and I'm always like, "What? What's with your issue with stereo?" You know. Yeah, uh, I think uh, when I was when I was starting out it was really it was really big stereo days. Um, I th- there was a lot like back then it, it was right in the middle of like now it's in stereo and everything, and um, there was a lot of people that I knew from university that that went and did um, working at Stereo D or Prime Focus. Um, but you you weren't really it wasn't. In my opinion, it wasn't really an avenue towards compositing because they, those studios don't have a compositing department, or at least they didn't at the time. So you were kind of stuck, and um, they would entice people with, with a lot of money. So the people that were working at Stereo D and Prime Focus were making a lot more money than I was um, as a as a roto or prep artist. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like th- those didn't tr- t- transition very well um, to to actual compositing jobs. And so it was sort of like a short-lived, um, almost, I wouldn't say it was dead end, but it was, um, it was certainly not as, as smooth as an avenue. I, I think that people, like recruiters and stuff, also didn't give the respect. Because um, you are, paint, you are um, doing paint and roto there, but I just don't, don't think they gave the type of respect as um, they would have to somebody that was doing junior comp work or, or uh, roto work. That, they also did night shift there, I think, back in the day. I don't know if they do it anymore, but that was another place. I know a few people. I got that a friend that. that just finished his degree in accounting, and he's getting all these, you know, hey, come on, interview over here, you know, and it's all these like sleazy jobs. And I'm like, okay, hold off on some of these, buddy. You know, I'm not saying yeah. that Stereo D and all those guys are sleazy. I don't know anything about them or their history. Um, I was just, I, I know that there was a lot of what I've heard was there was a lot of feedback from people that were like, I that whole rotoscoping 2d 3d conversions or 3d to uh i'm sorry 2d to 3d conversion stuff that's just not for me i just can't stand that stuff i go i would go crazy you know and i'm yeah, like oh it's, okay it's a very narrow like like i like i i have converted stuff in the past and i've worked on films at luma um that were shot in stereo so they had two cameras mm-hmm. and that was the time where they were like experimenting whether or not that was a better result um and that was kind of useful because a lot of the paint that you needed to do you needed to do it in the 3d so it got you really comfortable with projections and all that stuff but and there's not there's not a lot of stereo like we don't convert stuff um as compositors um at bigger studios now we we package our scripts up and we send it send it somewhere to convert it so i don't think those skills really translate that well like like i i don't i don't typically make depth maps um for my comps and stuff so um, gotcha. uh, that's why I don't think it translates all that well. Um, but but certainly, I mean, if you ha- if you have a choice of no job or stereo job, I think definitely take the stereo job. But uh, but definitely look for a way out as fast as you can, um, <laughs> and try to try to keep leveling leveling up. Um, uh, in my opinion, the the fastest way to move up is to move over. So you might start as a junior at a company. And they'll pay you a certain rate. And uh, if you stay with, if you stay at the same place for three years, maybe you'll learn a ton. But they're not gonna give you ten dollar, twenty dollar raises. You know, like y- you'll have to. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's better for your for your rate uh, to to move over to another studio and then charge five more dollars or or whatever. Um, and then you just kind of do that a few times. Um, and you'll get more experience because you're meeting different people. You're introduced to different pipelines and stuff. Like, like I- I'm not saying that you can't start somewhere and and um, and like become. I mean, I know people that started as runners and they they become like comp soups. So that it's totally possible to do it. But um, if if you want to jump up quickly, you'll want to like okay, you got this. Now you go to this place and you charge a bit more. Um, you put this. You update your resume. You keep, you keep trying to do this um, stepping stone kind of thing. Um, that is that is the quickest way um, I think that you can you can level up. 
What, I, what I'm hoping to do in regards to, because what I find is there's a lack of awareness of actual rates that you should be quoting, and it differs in location. Mm. And I wish there was like a website that was an anonymous location where someone can go and be like, oh, okay, the average rate in Chicago is, the average rate in London is, the average rate is. So when you're offering, you don't over-offer, you know, like, oh, I want a million dollars. You know, and they're like, uh, no, I don't think so. You know, and you're wondering why you're not getting calls. Yeah. Um, do you know of any resource like that? Well, there, there was Glassdoor. Um, I think I think that was pretty useful. Uh, at this at this day and age, like, when I when I go to a country, I'll usually um, I usually will know somebody from there or somebody that has been in that in that area. And uh, maybe you could maybe you can ask it on a forum or something or in uh, some sort of nuke place. But usually I'll ask somebody like a range, like oh, what, what's the typical thing? Um, and if I have if I have absolutely no idea, like um, you might. You might want to receive an offer from the country first, and then negotiate from there. Because yeah, like you, you don't always know the living expenses. You don't always know the current, the going rate is probably different per city, per country. Um, so that, it can be pretty confusing. But um, but um, it, yeah, I think just you got to play it by ear, and you have to respect the different countries pay different things. Like. Like um, like I had to pay. Uh, I had to take a pay cut when I went from LA to to London, and that's just. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. It's just you know a different work environment, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but you you have to you have to play it by the rules of that country or whatever. You have to, you have to play the game in a way. Play. Yeah. <laughs> the phrases I keep learning when I work at these studios is like, "Fake it till you make it." Play the game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, okay, so NPC Fast and the Furious Eight um, was that the one where the guy passed away, or was that? I mean, it was, yeah, yeah, he had to be digi doubled. I was just doing um, was some like car scenes. It was some practical explosion. I actually think you played some of the video. I think it, it was possible that Erwan and I were working together. Or maybe it was just a huge team, and maybe I never. But you were playing some of the sequence from that. I think in his video. Um, of the car, like I, what I do is, I, if if anyone's wondering and they're looking over, it's like I know Tony didn't work on that movie. I'm like, what I'm doing is I'm playing some eye candy on the left, which has something to do with some of the studios. Not saying that all the shots you see are done by Tony or whatever guest I have. It's just to have some eye candy during these interviews because what I noticed in interviews that people like Alan McKay, who was incredibly awesome and wonderful and great, um, is you, you get a lot of talking head stuff, and it's like I think it helps get you through these mm -hmm. conversations by like, oh, look Definitely. at the, the look at the pretty colors on the left side of the frame, you know, and <laughs> I don't know. It just helps with you. And then you still absorb all of this awesome information that you're giving, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's just getting a feel and trying to keep, keep people on fire for VFX. You know, it is a passion project and you guys and the teams you work with, you guys are band of brothers. You do this for the passion, you know, not for mm -hmm. the dollar bills, I don't think. Part. Yeah, it's a big part of it. Um, I think uh, well, I think either Richard or Richard or Hugo are mentioning, yeah, you like you do what is it? You do the films for the passion, and you do the commercials for the money, and that kind of thing. <laughs> a lot of that's true. Um, well, it's they, not well, what I always hear is films are films are timeless, and commercials are like they're gone. You know, they like I did a commercial yes. spot for a Christmas with Sam Jackson and Capital One. That was like gone, and then just like you'd be lucky to find <laughs> it on YouTube if you you know. Yeah. It's definitely more more glorious, but it, it's not. It's also not saying that you can't make fun, money in other fields. Um, like you can be smart about about stuff, and especially um, a, a lot of places will. You know, they'll hire you and for only three months, and then they'll they'll pay for your hotel possibly. So if you, I mean, if you work at a at a country for three months and your hotel is paid for, and you're making as much as you would be in your home country. Then I mean, you, I mean, you can make a lot of money. I mean, it's, and then you can go on holiday or do whatever you want to do. But I, it's it's not saying that it's it's impossible to make money in the industry. I mean, I, I know a lot a lot of people struggle, um, and it's it's no it's no easy industry. But I think I think that snowball effect does help. Um, like once you're in it, you're kind of in it. It's very hard. I remember it was so hard to get into it. Um, but once you're in it, you're kind of definitely in it. Um. Okay, so we got. I'm gonna kind of speed speed run some of these because I know we're I'm, we're already at 48 minutes into this interview. <laughs> um, Zoic Studios, uh, Gentleman Scholars, and then you hit 
Frame Store LA, uh, where yeah. it looks like you did a lot of commercial work there. Um, yeah, it was all commercials there. Yeah, it was great. Um, it was one of my favorite studios I think that I've ever worked for. Um, we were. It was sort of the beginning of a satellite office, and there wasn't um, there wasn't as much as as a pipeline there, and there was a very small team, and um, I think we together we helped build our own pipeline, and. Um, it, it was great. I, I loved everybody that I worked with there. It was another very learn, like great learning environment. Um, again, like it's my opinion. Like I know other people that have worked there and just didn't like it at all. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I had a great time when I was working there, and that's also <laughs> where um, I started doing the the keying tutorials. And I can I can kind of get into to that if you, if you want like what inspired me to kind of do that um, yeah we for those of you that, that don't know i don't see how you couldn't know if you were a compositor um uh tony if you if you just google search youtube anything on key years of nuke he's he's one of the top guys i think the godfather himself uh uh, uh here we go again with names um steve wright steve, wright, steve wright's at the top with his beautifully yeah. simplistic and almost childlike approach to That's great you know, understanding nodes, but next up on the list is Tony, um, <clears throat> and I think I'm third. But that is pretty pathetic because why am I the third? I've only got very little experience in VFX industry, so my call is not to call VFX artists pathetic. But I'm saying for those of you in the industry, if you get any time, and I know you're busy, please put out some training on YouTube because we could all benefit from it. And I, I really think there could be. I know some, some people are putting up training now more than ever. On different websites and so forth, you're seeing a lot of this um, all over the the web. But I really think us as a community really need to start, you know, just throwing stuff out because this is the future, and the demand is so high. Just like I'm talking about with uh, what was talking about through uh, what's called that we need to have more industry standard level tutorials on the internet for everybody to understand so that they're not just using the basics and most schools will just teach the basics so yeah uh, i had a i had a professor in, in university um pedro flores a really great guy shout out to pedro as well um uh, he had a, a presentation that he did in one of one of his lectures and he he mentioned something that really resonated with me um it was like this quote and it was um what we do for ourselves dies with us and what we do for others is immortal. And I thought that was really great. Like it doesn't really matter how much you know, if you get hit by a bus and, and like die tomorrow, like all that, that's all going to die with you. You know, like that's, that's <laughs> not over. So it doesn't, so it's, it's how much you can give back and put out. And, um, I think that's really what speaks to, and n nobody likes the person that, that says like, Oh, that I can't tell you that because it's a trade secret. Like, <laughs> like that's not what the community is about, you know. Like, um, like pe people will remember you too. If like, oh yeah, that's the guy who really helped me on that shot, or that's the guy who really knows his stuff because he's willing to share. And that's that's always who I remember and who I want to. Next time I have a question, I'll go to that person and ask him or or shoot him a message or something. So, it is, isn't you shouldn't be shy about sharing stuff and. That's and, the thing. Um, nobody knows anybody. Nobody knows any of these compositors' names except when I went to work at what is now Carbon VFX. I'm like uh, Tony Lyons. Oh, Tony Lyons is awesome. Is awesome. You know, it's just like every one of them in there is like Tony Lyons, all oh, the man. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. You know, obviously everybody knows Tony here because you know we're using his uh, an amalgamation, whatever you want to say it, of, of his uh, his script work. Um, that I don't know. Us. I don't know how it, it got to that. Like I, I wasn't trying to um, be the guy who invented King or something. I just uh, I was really frustrated that there weren't enough advanced level tutorials, uh, and you know as I started to get into mid and senior comp, um, you know you, you learn a bunch of tricks in every place you go to, and I was like, why isn't why isn't this out there? Why haven't people like clearly people know this stuff? Just use it's key just light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I just decided to to make some some videos. Um, there was. I normally wouldn't have, have um, done it. There's actually, I'll take like a side tangent here. Like, um, I'm very hesitant because I'm always, I'm always very judgmental of myself, um, self-critical, and I'm like, what, what the hell do I know? Um, why should I, like, why should I be teaching people how to key? Like, like I, I don't know about keying, um, but I mean, first of all, like somebody has to, um, and, and second of, like, second of all, um, I think I, I was becoming a 
a bit of a in the leadership position a little bit in and frame store like we work on commercials and uh you know my comp soup was amazing uh jd yeah that's he's a great guy he's still there um at frame store la but um he, yeah like we would divide up um commercials and, and sometimes i would be in kind of a lead position and um we had this kind of problem where people were coming in and out of the studio and uh not every not everybody knew how to key or everybody had their own way to key and uh you know when you when you're working on a commercial and you like bring somebody in you need them to like like do something right away and i kind of had this idea of grandeur like they they kind of wanted me to make videos for frame store like maybe specifically and like and and teach whatever i was doing and i was like well i don't really want it to be you know frame store specific and i've like it doesn't really help if you kind of like go to a place and you need to learn something immediately uh, well, if it's on YouTube for free, maybe people will just kind of pick it up, and uh, maybe I won't need to. Because I was having to like train people as they came in, and I was like, well, maybe maybe I'll save myself. It was a bit selfish. Maybe I'll save myself some time, and I'll just like point them to this YouTube video that I made instead of like taking the hour to <laughs> show them. So it's not always like I wasn't always looking for glory or something. I was kind of like eh, gonna give back, but also that something would exist out there for free that people can just watch. And and I'm glad it's helped a lot of people. Um. You know, there's there's plenty of other ways to key, and there's plenty of other ways to to do stuff. Um, you know, the, the, there's like a hundred ways to tackle a problem in VFX and co compositing. So uh, I wouldn't say it's like, you know, this is how you have to do it. But um, I'm I'm sure it's helped some people. It's it's pretty cool. I'm glad. Cool. Yeah. Um. What was I gonna say? I kind of lost track. Um, you know, might might I ask you to refresh your video feed just one more time? Yeah. Yeah, that way I could just, it seems like it's, uh, I'll edit this out. There we go. Okay. You were, you were, you were playing through fine. It was just a matter of some weird issue. Um, so from frame store to double negative, Star Trek, Beyond, Captain America, Inferno, Geostorm, Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part 2, Terminator, Genesis, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, and Avengers Age of Ultron, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of that was a that was a crazy year, um, 2015. I, I got hot potatoed pretty pretty badly on the, like it was like two months over time, two months over time, two months over time. Like so, that's how that's that's that many projects. Uh, how do you not crank under the, the pressure like that? I mean, how do you how do you not how do you keep your sanity? If you don't mind me asking. Um, <laughs> I think you need to. Well, some would I, say I, a lot of drinking. I don't know if that's true. I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> There is a pub life in London, which is cool. Um, no, um, everyone has their own their own secret to how they deal with stuff. Like for me, I, I I found like traveling and and stuff like that was that was a big thing for me. So like while I was doing all that stuff, like I, I would take the weekend and I'd go to Rome and I'd go to Amsterdam and stuff. And and between projects, I um, I was able to negotiate with them and say, hey, if you don't need me, like I don't need to be here. Like you can, um, you know, you, you can have me off for like a month and that way I was able to like de-stress and like yeah you know, I'd go like travel in Europe or something and then uh and then by the time the month was by I was ready to go into the next project but um I think yeah you should always look for that light at the end of the tunnel like like it like if you have to have something to look for either you you love the project or you love the money or you have this secondary reason for why you're doing it do you um, do you have pretty... in your brain uh like a a decompression compression period of time at x number of overtime hours before you you think you're going to crack and you're like i need to get out of here and chill out in rome for a while before you crack um i mean for me when i when i if i were to crack it's it's when you don't know when it's going to end um that's very that's pretty common which is which kind of sucks um like though the some some places will have you do you know four months of overtime like six days a week 12 plus hours a day um but where where but as long as you know that it's gonna that it's gonna end and you're gonna get your holidays or something you're, you're kind of good it's when they roll you on to another project and that's also in overtime and that's also um you know also just in overtime hours and you don't know when that project's gonna end or you don't know when they're gonna if you're gonna put you on another project that's in overtime so this like this like never-ending cycle of overtime that that's when you what well, it's up to you to talk to your artist manager or your producer or your your like you have to 
you have to draw the line at some point, you know. And uh, like as as you get um, further along in your career, you'll you'll have more say, you know, because people crack. I mean, it's better for your mental health and your in your career to to take those breaks and or to to make some sort of negotiation because eventually you're you're just get pissed off and you're gonna leave. So I don't think that's good for a studio and that's <laughs> not good for you. So you have to you have to work. So out you you have to draw the line. Yeah, well, it can help anybody to just sit there and be frustrated and not, not mention it. Because then you just grow resentment and then you just grow hatred toward the company and then you just leave. And, you know, like if you, at least if you call them and like, hey, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of stress after that last project. Can you put me on a, another project that's quieter or, or at the beginning stages? Or can I have some time off or whatever? Or maybe, you know, maybe you just, um, uh, one of the things about, trying working is that you don't, you don't need to pick up a job right after the next job if you don't if you don't have to like like uh, I can um, I can space out sometimes my time like like oh before I pick up the next job I'll I'll, I'll save myself like a month and I'll go do something you know um, right now I have um, a month and a half or two months um, off until the next project and you know I plan on traveling and doing some personal stuff so um, that's, I mean you can find ways around it. Um, some people want a financial situation to do it. Um, hey, Tony, but, um, I, I hate yeah. to, I'm tr- sorry to not interrupt here. Um, can we, uh, I'm going to edit this. Um, I'm hit the, there was a little bit of a garble at the end there, the last part of your conversation from the connection. Can we sure. uh, recreate this? Uh, can you, I'm, I'm going to disconnect. If you can just reconnect with me. Yeah, um, sure. I'm going to, okay. Let's keep yeah, going yeah, here. No worries. Yeah. So we got uh, Industrial Lights and Magic next. Uh, that's where you made the big jump to Singapore. Um, before we go over your history with Kong Skung I- uh, Skull Island, yeah. um, <clears throat> what was it like moving to Singapore? And also, in your opinion, since you've traveled everywhere, uh, what is your favorite city country to work in? Ooh, that's a pretty difficult one. Um, I get asked that a lot. Um, and I quite like Germany. That's that's where I am now. But uh, I like I like London. I think um, I don't know why. Like I always wanted to go there, and when I was there, I, I really liked it. There's a lot to do. It's a great jumping off point. Um, it, there's like pros and cons to every city, you know. Um, Singapore was great because it was close to Southeast Asia, and I wanted to travel there. And uh, it was a different environment. China was great because of all the like the the community that you have there, like. When you're in such a kind of like alien place as a Westerner, you kind of stick with other people, and your bonds are much stronger. You like you need to help each other out, and uh, yeah, I was the China was like the first place I traveled to outside the U.S. It's kind of crazy, um, and I didn't even bring like a translation book or anything with me, so it's kind of stupid in that regard. Um, but yeah, like you build these like strong um, communities of friends when you're there, and you're always. You're always helping each other out, and uh, it feels like that was like the fastest I ever made friends. Um, and I'm still friends with them to this day. All those people and we've met up in other places around the world and everything. Um, so every country has its pros and cons. And um, Singapore, and specifically, uh, amazing country. I mean, it's really clean. It's not what you would expect. It's um, I like to I like to say it's kind of like it's a very Western country that's located in um, Southeast or, or Asia. Um, it like newest buildings, like everything is super clean. Like I mean, it is. It's way more modern than a lot of the European cities, you know, because those are uh, really really old, and, and Singapore is like brand new. Um, so very different. And, and English is their first language there. They speak English. So I mean, it, it's it's very comfortable. It's a great place. To, like if you're nervous about it, don't be. It's it's very cool. Lots of great food. Um, so you're expensive. saying you can and, go out into the markets and you know buy lunch and everyone will speak English? Yeah, they speak English there. It's, uh, oh, wow. it's their national language. They speak other things as well. But um, how about the it, it uh, is, cost uh, of living though? I mean, that's got to be. Yeah, well, fun, I didn't. Right? I didn't have. Um, I didn't have an apartment when I was there. Like that was one of the countries that I was lucky enough to to have. Uh, I was put into an apartment living or a hotel um, for the duration of my contract, which is great. Um, and that, that's not always the case, but sometimes you'll be able to strike a deal um, to do that. And so I was living in a hotel in, in, um, pretty much near Marina Bay Sands. And if you know Marina Bay Sands, it's like the three towers with the giant boat on top. 
and uh, I was living there. It was great. Um, and not everything is as expensive as you would think. Like, for example, uh, like you could take uh, I could take a taxi like to work, and it was like a twenty five minute ride, and it only cost me like ten dollars or something, or like seven dollars. I mean, if you tried to take a forty minute ride in Los Angeles. could go get, um, like, a Naples-style pizza for, like, $25. Uh, but, like, a lot of the street food is really cheap, and it's delicious, you know? So you could spend $2 and get, like, a full meal. So I, I would say there was a lot of range um, to to what you could spend or buy there. Um, and, yeah, the, 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 cult, the culture is really interesting. Um, I had a really good time there. Um, it's really hot because it's located right on the equator. And... Uh, yeah, it's you, you take a shower and then you go outside and you're just immediately sweating. I think uh, everybody was wearing shorts and stuff. But I felt bad for the Singapore people because they were wearing business suits. I don't know how they did. <laughs> they made it just used to it. Um, it's pretty crazy. But uh, yeah, every time. Well, you're 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 the the actual uh, ILM building is like the uh, replicated version of the sand crawler from Star Wars, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, and they had the little Yoda there and everything. And, I mean, the buildings that are next to it are also just crazy. Like, you, you always see these crazy architectural illustrations or something in, like, AutoCAD or something, and the, they, these buildings that came to life. That was one of the coolest things about Singapore was these crazy buildings, and they had, like, gardens on the top of the buildings that were, like, you know, so it's just really crazy stuff. Um Cool. Hey, Tony, I, I, I hate to do this again to you. I'm going to disconnect my internet and go through. Um, we're just getting a little sure. bit of, I'm getting everything you're saying. It's just, it's kind of garbled video and so forth. So let sure. me disconnect and um, I will call you back. Is that cool? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah sure. Zoom. Okay. Um, so I, one of the questions before we sort of leave your career, I know you worked at, I, can you briefly tell me about Ilura? Uh, um, Ilura? Laura. Laura. In Laura, yeah, Sydney. um, that, that they were one of the companies that caught my eye, um, early on. And I, I wanted to work, I wanted to work in Australia for at least a year and, uh, you know, do the whole East Coast kind of trip in Australia. Um, and, uh, they, they caught my eye. They had really good breakdowns. It seemed like they were like a smaller, um, a smaller company. And, uh, I think as the, as people go to different companies, they'll, they'll get a preference. And for me, I sort of like, smaller teams like companies that were around like one one or two hundred people like some like not like these giant thousand people companies and so I was kind of looking for places and uh, that caught my eye so I ended up going there worked there for a month and a half um, a lot of that was pretty pretty stressful overtime stuff but um, it was balanced out a little bit by my ability to like travel for like five weeks between projects and stuff which is pretty cool uh, unfortunately, so they, they got acquired by Method Studios, um, and uh, they did a whole transition, and unfortunately, um, about a month after I left, they closed the office, so they don't exist anymore in Sydney. Um, they still exist in Melbourne, so. We, um, had, we had a Method in Chicago, and it closed. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're um, I think they were rejiggling, like, where they wanted to focus, because they bought a lot of, I think they bought Atomic Fiction in Vancouver or something like that, or Montreal, maybe. And uh, they were, I think they maybe they purchased too much or something, and they, they were kind of um, closing some places, opening some places. Um, but yeah, it was kind of sad because um, the mar the market in Australia isn't too huge. So I mean, everybody ended up at like they ended up getting laid off and uh, um, having to go either move to another city or try to scramble for work in in Sydney. Um, I'm sure some they're probably fine now. Um, a lot of them, but. Um, yeah, this stuff like that happens, you know, like uh, like Digital Domain in Florida, Rhythm and Hughes, a lot of other companies. Like they get they get they go out of business, or they they close office, or they go bankrupt, and that is a scary part of the industry. But it's definitely a reality. And uh, you, as somebody working in the industry, you have to really um, watch out for yourself. Don't don't ever feel like too safe because. <laughs> The next month, you, it, the the whole company could just go bankrupt. 
Um, is, that, is that a commonality? Is there is there sort of like a general paranoia in the ethos, or I mean, is uh, is it is it that tight right now? I mean, how bad is it? How bad is bad? Is it bad or? <laughs> mm. Um, I don't know what it was like like in the past, but it's definitely. I mean, if you can last ten years in the industry without going through some sort of like layoff or something, I'd be pretty surprised. Um, it, it's just the nature of how it works. It's so volatile and the projects are, you know, the companies don't know if they're going to, they don't have like, they're not like the Marvel Cinematic Universe where they know what project they're going to work on for the next five years in a row. Um, they're, they're like, um, they just go project to project. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of them, a lot of fishing. A lot of them, yeah, they gamble with, they'll use the money from the last project to pay for this project kind of thing, I think. And a lot of them get into, so if their job falls through for them, I think they get into some pretty big trouble. And uh, personally, I mean, I I haven't, I'm not the only one, but I haven't been paid before um, for work that I've done. Um, I think that that can be quite common. So like uh, there's there's a few months where I just wasn't paid. Um, I mean, I'm sure people have been through companies that went bankrupt and then they don't pay you because they go bankrupt. Um, so, I mean, I could give some advice to some people, um, as from what I, from what I know, um, and this is just my opinion, but I always try to find a secondary reason why I'm working at a place. Like I don't, I don't just go in there for one reason, like, oh, they're going to pay me well or something because you, you have to face the reality that you could be laid off or you could even not be paid, uh, with no legal ramifications. Um, and you have to find a reason for why you would work there besides getting – so even if you didn't get paid or even if uh, something terrible happened, like the whole company gets laid off, that, that somehow it was still worth it for you. And I could give some examples like um, maybe you haven't worked on a film yet and the company that you're going to is working on a film. So at least you'll have a film credit. Another example would be um, – you, um, some of my examples would be like I went to Singapore and I wanted to travel so even if I got laid off well I'm still in Singapore and I still get to travel around this, this area, local area you know um, interesting uh, th- there's tons of reasons why you uh, uh, in addition to being paid well that you'll have to find for yourself and as long as you have reasons um, maybe it's a good learning experience maybe it was a great project a fun project um uh, maybe you learned a lot. Um, there's always you should always try to find as many reasons as possible to work places, and and that's my advice to people. Like don't don't always bank on one thing. Gotcha. The um, you know, I it's it's, it's pretty interesting when you see it. Just even uh, you know, looking at your experience at Double Negative, all the movies within a span of just a year, a year and a half, or whatever. How many shots does an average artist work on with these big budget movies? Like, for instance, Thor. How many visual effects shots did you work on Thor? Yeah, uh, I would say like anywhere from four to ten or something. Um, it depends on how long you're on the project. Like, if you're on the project from the beginning, then maybe you'll work on like. 15 or something but yeah on, on, on average I mean there's a lot of project that you only have four shots um, and sometimes they'll they'll group shots together that are very similar so maybe you'll work on like eight shots but four of them were the same angle and so you know you could maybe only use one of those for, for your reel because they're all the same so stuff like huh. that'll happen um, usually you'll have like one or two awesome shots and then like a bunch of kind of just Mediocre stuff. Yeah. Now, how do you how do you work in tandem with the with the uh, colorist to make sure you ensure a precise match in color between you know color contrast you know uh, yeah th- between the previous shot and the forward shot which most likely will be a visual effects shot and throughout the whole process is there like sort of like a like a big visual effects house like Industrial Lights and Magic is there some sort of template you guys deal with or is there some way of they're like, oh no, lift the blacks up, oh, because you're basically taking an image that's straight from a green screen sometimes, and you're pulling it, and you gotta worry about the skin tones, but then you gotta match up to this everything else in your shots. And are you guys yeah. working in like 4K or 8K or what are you what are you doing right now? <laughs> um, depends on the show. Netflix is really big on 4K, so any Netflix show is probably gonna be 4K. Um, we work on some 4Ks in in Sydney, so um, but on on films is usually 2K, I think. 
Yeah, you, um, you so take 2K, but you pump it up to 4K. So does that mean when we're watching a movie, we're looking at 4K, 4K, and then a visual effect shot, 2K, and then back? Or I don't, I mean, I, I don't ever know if, how many how many things are actually displayed in 4K? I know I know Netflix displays its own movies in 4K, yeah, but they're, they're big I mean, if you watch a Blu-ray, I think it's still 1080p. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, but but a lot of I mean, if they're gonna if they want to work on 4K, you know that's that's the new that's towards that direction. So um, that can really suck because I, oh, as work- students, you know, the students they don't have any render farms. We're like, hey, let's let's shoot this. Sh- visual effects shot in 4k and one of my students <laughs> that works at the mill we did it and um yeah they're like let's not do that again <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you know, can I've... render it you render it in 2k or something like um i mean for a student you just need 1080p like, yeah because the, the recruiters the recruiter's not going to watch your, your demo reel in 4k we just did it as a gag <laughs> for one your... time we're like hey let's do 4k let's see how this looks and you know there's a video on youtube it's like you can't see 4k or something it's a Famous video that says you really can't see 4K, or you you can but you can't, you know. Yeah. So um, you definitely feel it <laughs> when you're working on it. Um, there's another thing that happens too that you you can't yeah uh, you can't see. So, so the image is naturally going to get scaled down to whatever screen you're you're working on. And uh, I mean you're you're not working on bigger than like 24 inch screens when you're at a studio. So um, like you you can't see the entire image. So like when you go one to one, you'll have to see the grain and stuff. So often you'll you'll be like looking at corners of a of this of the screen searching for if your grain is matched or not. So that can be pretty annoying at times. And you're um, all working like if you're at IL, ILM, you're working on computers with uh uh really nice, you know, 10 bits uh mm-hmm. what is it like PC uh, P3 uh like monitors, I'm assuming. Yeah, they're and all then you're all 10 bit and um just workflows and so forth. Yeah. Usually it's dual monitor and one of them's calibrated and the other one's kind of just for like where you put your nodes and stuff. Um, yeah, I forget what the name of the company. It's like Ezio, Ezio. I think it's kind of like a really common. And then one BenQ I... is like the budget version for us folks that can't afford those type of things. Yeah. If you're like yeah. a starting artist or you know. But in regards yeah. to like what I was talking about earlier, uh, colors work. Sorry if I'm jumping around yeah. a lot. So um, yeah, no, no, I'll back to that. Um, it's kind of a technical question, but. The way that it should work, um, at least on films, um, and the way that it does work in many places, is is um, you'll so there'll be a, a show LUT or a sequence LUT, uh, a LUT a lookup table. So that's like what the colorist pumps out and that we apply to things. Um, when you're in Nuke, you're working in linear and you're working um, just on your plate, and the LUT gets applied either on the QuickTime level or like on the render level or something. Um, but as far as like matching the different shots, that's that's up to the studio. But a lot of times things will be what's called neutral graded, which means they'll be balanced to each other, and um, it's really important for um, for a CG workflow because if you're working on CG and you have many shots with different renders, you'll want them all to look the same in every shot. Like you don't want the lighter to have a lighting setup for every single shot. That's like just because it's like minutely different. Um, so oftentimes either, um, a supervisor, um, of CG or comp will grade everything out or an editor will grade everything so that they're balanced. And so everything will be neutral graded. You'll work in neutral graded, you'll reverse the neutral grade and then apply the client LUT onto it. So you're working, um, so that you could kind of copy and paste, um, either like different nodes or different keys, uh, or different CG um, to different scripts, and that they should look pretty much the same. That's that's the way that it theoretically should work. It doesn't always work like that, but it's the way that should should happen. Is the, do you find and I, I had this issue when I was at uh, Another Realm Studios where we started building all these incredible tool sets to make things quicker, cheaper, faster, and not have to repeat building assets. But we found yeah. that all our video games ended up looking like GTA all of a sudden because we were using <laughs> the same tools. Do you find any of that? Like for instance, and I'm not. This is my opinion, this is not Tony's opinion, but whenever I see an ILM trailer, I always see the same lens flare that's a <laughs> big blue line. <laughs> but then that you look animal. at Blade Runner, and Blade Runner, you know, they're talking about rendering every single droplet of rain having refraction through it, and you're like, you just look at Blade Runner 2049, and you're like, wow, that's a whole nother, that just looks so real, you know, versus something that has a stylized 
like uh, Marvel look to it. You know what I mean? And yeah. is there is there tools that you're kind of you would look at in from a perspective of an artist and say I think we're relying too much on this and it's starting to create a pattern that audiences are picking up on. That's a good question. Um, yeah, the lens flare thing is probably that. There, there's like ten lens dirts. You know those like like the patterns on the on the the lens. You're not uh, using video like, co-pilot, right, for ILM? Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all video. I mean, I love Andrew Kramer's stuff, but uh, I think um, you you should as a as a comper, you should uh, definitely try your best to like vary stuff. You know, at the the least you can do is like mirror it and uh, and maybe like combine a couple effects together or like if you if you're uh, making a lens flare um if you're if you're using video copilot on a on a professional level um you, you'll probably want to find a reference of a lens flare and uh try not to use the defaults and, and you know try to try to match the reference as best as you can it's not going to be perfect but at least you'll have a a real life uh, reference of what something looks like and so um if you have a specific lens flare that's coming from one of your plates um, you know, you'll try to match that and maybe that'll, you might have to copy and paste that to different, um, shots in the sequence, but you know, it, that'll, that'll help to not make everything look so generic. Um, there's a lot of like 2d assets that people use a lot that are, that are very similar. Um, but you know, you can, you can use a lot of variation and stuff to, to get a lot out of something. So tr try to vary it up as much as you can. Don't use the default settings. That's a great that's a great uh, lesson I always teach my students is that get some reference. Get some reference, look at it. Don't just think, oh, lens flare, there it is, done. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. try to match real life as much as you can. Grounded in reality, you know what I mean? Take the time to, you know, take the less, you know, take the uh, narrow path here and actually say, you know what, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go and shoot something and, even as I can see, I think you have a photography background too. I always tell my students, like, go and buy a DSLR and run out the door and film, you know. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys using, a quick question, are you guys using Deep at all over there a lot? Or how's Deep in the industry? Is that is that something that's it's, like only when you have a bunch of uh, Planet of the Apes running around, you know? Yeah, good question. Um, it's, it's getting more and more, uh, like, it, you see it more and more. It, it's very project- and situation dependent. Um, I would say you probably don't want to use deep if you have a simple A over B scenario. Like if you're putting a um, a character over a background, like a CG character over a background, you, you don't need deep. Um, but if you're rendering a lot of uh, volumetrics in, from Houdini uh, and it needs to go between this thing and this object, then yeah, you're probably going to use deep. Um, the way that I've the way that I've seen it used most often is is that they'll use it for the alpha bit of it so they won't like you won't composite in deep um a lot um and this, this is my experience i mean i'm sure what has their own uh, workflow on it um but but you'll you'll use it for layering and the, the rationale is um if you, if you're rendering with holdouts uh in your cg then if one of the cg elements changes like say the character has a new animation update then they don't have to render a new simulation of a of a cloud or something like they can just use the same simulation because that's got deep, and then the character will, um, you, you'll be able to find the holdout and update that alpha um, to match the new the new thing. So that so when you separate the elements, you won't have to render them over again, which is really useful. But um, mm -hmm. again, it's you don't have to use it all. If you don't have to use it, don't use it because it's yeah, very heavy. It's, it's heavy. It's expensive, and it's. I'm trying to do a tutorial on deep, and it's like, wait a minute, how much was one single deep image? How am I going to get this online? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, a lot of times yeah. you'll you'll use it just for the holdout, and you'll pre-render it, and then you'll use that alpha as your holdout. And every time your your render updates, you'll need to render that out again. But going that makes going sense. back to two D is the the best the best because all your tools are available in two D. Like you can't be using fancy gizmos in a deep mode and stuff. So um, yeah, so yeah, the deep want, world is limited. Um, but what I find, yeah, I think that makes sense. You see a lot of these tutorials be like, everyone's using deep, baby, and it's like. Well, hold on a minute. I notice everything seems to be just holdouts. You're using the alpha holdouts in emergency mm -hmm. situations. You're not like, oh, here we are in deep. Put another a a alien in there. You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's good for adding volumetrics into things, but usually you're going to have to, if something moves through those volumetrics, you're going to have to have some kind of collision object to, 
You know, yeah. you can't just like layer this crap up and have things walk through clouds of mist and be like, oh yeah, it's good, you know. Yeah. But um, um, there, there's also a different field of deep, um, which is um, like there's the there's the deep that you can remove an object. I think that was the one that was seen in Planet of the Apes, where they were like, yeah, we can remove this ape and you can see the ape behind them. That's um, I have never, um, I don't think I've ever used that in the industry. But then you have to pre-render every ape. <laughs> individually no, it's, it's in the, well, yeah yeah it, so it gets really heavy it gets really heavy because every ape is there, there's like sub information of all the apes and stuff and uh, what i see more often is, is it's like a a really a really good deep or something like uh, sorry a really good like depth map or something like mm-hmm. so you can't you can't um remove an object and see the ob- object behind it um maybe at weta it's different i'm not sure but um usually it's strictly for layering purposes and strictly mm-hmm. for um, i mean that, it might like, be peter jackson going i don't like what that ape's doing over there in the corner <laughs> you did render this out in f- five thousand uh, dbxr passes right oh yeah every ape is rendered out you know certainly right. useful if you can uh, afford to work that way certainly yeah. would help but yeah well let's take a look at your reel and then we'll get to the questions because uh this has been a great interview by the way thanks a bunch like i said and no thank you thank you for everything that you you do on the channel so it's uh it's uh, really great to hear from everybody and Hugo and and uh, Richard and everybody. Let's uh, let's go ahead and play this. Now this is 2018. A lot of people don't update their reels because they're way too busy. Uh, <laughs> and you managed to still update your reel, which is awesome. I, I've got some students that are working in the industry and they haven't updated in like 10 years. You know, it's like <laughs> crying out loud. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt to have it updated. So I have the sound down just for the sake of this demo here. Yes. This, these are some incredible shots, by the way. I mean, Thank you. yeah, that was Geostorm, uh, kind of a B movie that came out a few years ago. <laughs> but uh, fun to work on. I mean, it's buildings crashing everywhere. So, um, that was the one I did at ILM. Uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the Kong shots uh, with Samuel Jackson. Sammy. Uh, <laughs> so some of those were using deep. Um, some of these are. Some of these are just um, some of the latest work that I did, like Bright and uh, Thor, and um, those are done in 4K. And um, they, everything has their own like technical challenge to it. Um, and what you want to do is you want to have an answer for for the recruiter of like why you have it in the beginning mm-hmm. of your reel or, or stuff. And so in some of these, like uh, we had to like replace part of the background and cut out the characters and stuff. And that was. Um, was it Civil War? Uh, with CG characters. Um, the Hunger Games one was a really difficult key. It's like a green screen that was, was cut that off. Was a key of her walking? Yeah, it was like half sky and then a green screen wall that ended and it was like cutting off like right on her head. So you had to like key the hair um, below the screen. This is probably my favorite one from Star Trek. Because this is was, the one they, gotta, they feature big time at ILM. I always see this in their reel. They feature this specific shot. Um, oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was cool that I got a breakdown. Because you don't often get breakdowns, but uh, that is something that I've heard that helps a lot with recruiters. And uh, Because you can see um, breakdown. And, and then I think I get into some commercials that I did in Framestore and other places um, towards the end. Um, I, try to, I try to leave in things that either I'm proud of or... Um, I thought were like technically interesting to talk about, so or or things that maybe I was the lead of. So in some of those, I was the lead of a team, and I could mention that if I um, had an interview or something. Yeah. Cool. Very very nice, sir. Um, I uh, I could I guess we can kind of like still frame some of this if we if we want sure. to here. Sure. So like. I camera shake. What do you guys use for camera shake? I'm just curious. Like, um, there, there's a there's a tool called Cam Quake. I think it's called, and it's pretty useful. Um, a lot of times you'll just have two camera shakes or three camera shakes. One that's doing like an overall motion, and one that's like really jittery. Um, you have to be kind of careful because you get into this like subframe movement, and if you have too much, it can kind of look a bit strange. So sometimes you'll need to like bake it out into keyframes or something. Um, hmm. but yes, a lot of times it's, it's really up to the artist. It's um, everybody's got their own kind of like secret sauce to how they use stuff. So. Is this but, like uh, an anim- is, 
Is this like a roto here of like a, and then you're just like, or is that like an actual lens flare plugin you guys use for? That was a, a lens flare. No, it wasn't a plugin. It was actually filmed. And a lot of times companies will have just giant libraries of, of um, pre-stocked lens flares, like actual lens flares. And if, if you can use one of those instead of using um, the video copilot one, it's probably preferable because there's so many little things in a lens flare that happens that um, that you can't really recreate or it will take you just too long to recreate. So if you can like reposition it and, and kind of like track it in a little bit, um, it can it can cause some some nice realism um, that you couldn't get from a plugin. Um, yeah, oh boy, some of that, that stuff must have been was, fun, huh? <laughs> that, one was, that one wasn't deep. That was uh, explosions and lots of holdouts for the different um, ships and everything. Um, you mean the hundred yeah, million ships each were rendered in deep? No. <laughs> Individually? Yeah, they're all, Oh. I think they broke. I think, if I remember, they broke it off into like far, really far away ships, mid ground ships, and these foreground ships. And then they did the same for the explosions, and uh, and everything was just put together. And then obviously the whole um, planet world um, silicon thing. Um, that was a pretty cool shot. I was pretty proud of it. it. They they were thinking it was gonna be a nightmare, but it ended up being okay at the end. So so it's good. Um, that was Geostorm. That that was one of my favorite shows to work in because it really pushed um, what I could do. Like uh, I learned a lot from it, and uh, I had a lot of experience. Like matching the the CG road um, to the real road and and trying to like blend them together. Because um, yeah, one of the one of the things you'll have to do is to match. You have to replace something that's live action with the CG one, and you'll have to use a lot of like. Um, depth and P world and P ref and everything to like really grade everything into place and match all the values and if you have a car and a CG car that's next to it a real car and a CG car like you have to match them pretty close to get them to to look okay so it's pretty challenging. Is this like a is this like a like a stock footage lens flare that you put in here? Or? I think that was moving. That was real. Moving evidence. Yeah, like it was. Um, like street I think they filmed like a Hong Kong street and it was like a reflection of a Hong Kong street to like, to like move over the windscreen or the windshield um, any difference between shooting anamorphic and not shooting anamorphic I mean compositing an anamorphic versus uh, it's kind of annoying with the uh, roto shape it's always being weird <laughs> weird like cylinders no it's not not really too bad you just have to remember to like some of the defaults that are set to an aspect of one-to-one -one and, like, exponential blurs and stuff, you also remember to, like, set it to set it to two. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's fine, I think. This is 100% CG, this guy here, or did they throw a dummy at the guy? In it was a, on, the, on the Kong one, it was a digital double, um, and he, yeah, he turns into a practical person with wires and everything, and he signs into the, the windscreen. And um, I think the background... So a lot of a lot of shots, you know, you either you you don't get to start start a lot of stuff from scratch. If you do, it's you're just very lucky. And so a lot of times, like they'll have these these things that are um, halfway done or like at a whip. Um, so they just slam out a bunch of whips, and then you know you'll get to finish it and stuff. And I can't remember. I think when that one was was halfway along or something, and ended up finishing it. So. Um, yeah, it's a green screen, and uh, that was a Samuel Jackson green screen. Um, He's got weird fingers. He's got like some weird finger disease or something because we had him holding up a credit card, and we we're like, ah. And he had he, oh, yeah. he had some like strange. Right. We had to like they had to like recreate his fingernails or something. I don't know. It was really really <laughs> weird. Um, just all I gotta say is thank God he's bald because. Uh, except <laughs> that chrome crazy. dome can be an issue when you do green screen with him. Um, specifically, his dome, I noticed. We had some issues uh, with it. Um, you know, Thor was an interesting movie. It had a weird stylistic look to it, you know. Um, yeah. I, I liked it. Yeah. I thought the idea was the, the, the concept, the way, the, the, the very, I mean, what would you call that? Like that pastelish type of feel? Yeah, I don't know. It was like this, exactly that. It was like this pastel trippy world that we're trying to recreate. There was a lot of, like, costume design that was 
kind of weird looking, um, but in a, in a stylized way. So, um, is he on a green screen here? Or is... uh, the background was a green screen. So where those people are standing was a green screen. And oh, right we had to replace the chair that he was sitting in with a CG chair. Really? And so sitting in a chair and we had to replace it. Uh, so all the hair and stuff, we had, we had trouble kind of. Oh boy, Luma, keying, what, that Luma keying and crap. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of like difference keying and Luma keying, and well, I mean sometimes you'll have to just um, paint hair back on or track in a still of hair. Um, you can't you can't always get away with with keying something, um, especially if, especially if you're like rotoing something or oh the key is not. So you get like a still even, you get like a still frame of a hair, track it in. And then lay your you can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you can do that, uh, or or just use it for the alpha of the hair. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of times you'll have to like fake a lot of stuff. It's not always so so easy to just key stuff. Like you, like I, I had a shot. Um, it's not on my reel, but it, it's from Outlaw King, like um, a Netflix film that I, I work on at at a uh, at Alora or Method, and. Um, Actually, uh, you could pull, you could pull it up. I think it's in a trailer for Outlawing on, on YouTube or something. But uh, um, it's basically Chris Pine sitting in a boat, and it it was like a thousand frames long, and he was just sitting there like staring off into space. And uh, the the we needed to like replace the coast, um, and you can see the the coast like going in like in and out of his like uh, like the horizon line was like going in and out of his hair. And it's going to like replace it. That's the one there, um, the second one. Sorry. Oh, the, the second one? Right here? Yeah, that, that specific shot, yeah. This so shot this, here? So this shot. Yeah, so this shot, you can see, like, the coast. So we had to replace the background because there was, like, some docks or whatever. And, uh, I mean, sometimes you'll just have to, you'll just have to paint um, hair. Or, or, like, you'll have to go frame by frame and like like reveal it back it's not always like painting it back but you'll find a technique that that will completely destroy you know 90 percent of the image but that one specific region will look amazing and you'll just need to sometimes paint that region you know like you'll just need to go in or roto it or, or whatever but i mean sometimes sometimes you have to do that um it depends but um, in that case, I had to do that for like a thousand frames, which was, was really fun. Wow. But How long did it take you? A few weeks. <laughs> a couple wow. of weeks, maybe. Yeah. See you in a week. So, um, yeah. I'm not being ignorant of your work. I'm just trying not yeah. to keep you here too long. Um, this movie, I never got to see this movie. Every I heard mixed reviews on it. I, I just never really had. Again, that's just my personal taste. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it was it was okay. I mean, um, I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, not not every movie you or project you work on is is going to be glorious or, or or you'll be proud of and stuff. Um, um, as of late, I think uh, I sometimes I even see the films that I work on. Some of them, um, like when you work on six in a year. Like sometimes you're like, ah, oh, I think I'll skip that one or something. Um, but you know, when you're proud of it and stuff, like yeah, I, I had, haven't seen it yet, but I'm definitely going to see it. I think it should be fun. I was working with uh, this guy, uh, Brad Moore, and I'm like, uh, he's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to go see Sully this weekend, and he's just like, oh, I worked on that. I'm like, really? Which shot? Like, did you see it at all? He's like, I haven't seen it. It was out for already a week. And he's just, I'm like, you don't, don't go see the movies you worked on? Yeah. It was weird. I knew what shots. I somehow knew what shots he worked on. I watched it and went, those two shots right there. And I went back to him. Did you work on these two shots? He's like, yeah, that was the ones I worked on. And it was just yeah. m- kind of mundane green screen shots before the flight takes off and the plane crashes. So mm-hmm. sure. um, Now, the stuff yeah. like this where the guy's going through the wall, how did you pull that off, if you don't mind me asking? Well, um, so there was there was a, a practical person there, and we had to match them. There was a digi double, the whole, so the whole thing is a CG guy. Um, but we had to match the the guy to the live action one. And so when you're doing something like that, and you need to match like real life, like you need to go in and make sure those highlights are exactly the same. You need to really change the CG. Um, somebody once told me like you should never 
use default like CG. You should always go in and play with the passes, try to make things better. Mm-hmm. And especially when you're matching real life, it comes really to just go relight the entire thing. Um, and, and it's it's unfortunate, but sometimes you know when you need to do it as a comper, it's your job. Like it's it's on your plate. So at the end of the day, it's it's uh, up to you to make it look good. And if you need to like add another light or or a rim light or something, or match every single element, you know, with crypto mats and stuff, you can like select his gloves and his head and everything and uh, match him. The effect itself, I think, was um, some Houdini stuff, and uh, we had some trouble getting this outline along the wall, and uh, they were able to pull off an effect, like, they were, you could put a card, and you there was a way for them to kind of, like, slowly, frame by frame, get this, like, perfect outline, and then uh, I think some of the frames I had to, like, paint myself, like, to, to get the connection to look right. I mean, so a lot of stuff, they go frame by frame in a lot of, of the effects. So uh, you, you'll spend some time working on stuff to get it to a high-quality What's thing. the What's the favorite uh, renderer over there? I know that ILM has their own proprietary renderer, but is it mostly V-Ray on Redshift, or is even Redshift on the market there yet? Or? Um, I, think, yeah, I think I've been hearing more about Redshift uh, more often, but I would say Arnold. It's probably uh-huh. Arnold and um, V-Ray. Depends on the project. They're, they both they they have a lot of pros and cons, I think, and I think depending on... So, oh, and Clarice as well um, is... is Clarice. Oh, but that might be... Yeah, is that a... Re- sorry, I'm for ignorance of renders, but... Clarice is a render, right? Do yeah, it's a, it, like when they did uh, Blade Runner 2049, they, I think they, they had those crazy scenes with a million buildings, so they threw it all on Clarice and it render it renders really, yeah. cl- uh, really fast. A friend of mine yeah. actually does all the tutorials for Clarice on CMI VFX, uh, Chris Tadeen, mm-hmm. and uh, he was showing me, and he's, he's like a guy I teach with over at uh, Flashpoint, and he's just like, check this out, man, and he, he just knows everything. I don't know, he's just crazy, yeah. uh, you know, he's, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. He's he's more famous on CMI VFX and so forth. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of him, uh, Chris Tadeen. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think I've seen Octane in a few commercials and stuff, because that's really fast, I believe. The price, so, I was looking at the price, because I'm like, maybe I should do an Octane, because I'm running out of ideas. That's why I'm like thinking about applying at some studios now, because I'm just like, I need I need to get back in so I can learn and then give it back. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Because it's like, I learned so much in just the two months that I was over at, uh, whatchamacallit, what is now uh, Carbon VFX, and I'm just like, man, I, I want to get back into that, and then I can come back and teach it. I think that's my strong suits, is just yeah. taking this information and just, I think you're, you're in the same boat, where you can teach this. You know, I mean, I, I, I've, I had a guy who's like the lead, he's one of the big shots in the game industry, and he was my uh, one of my students, and... I had him guest lecture at the school, and the kids were like, I don't know what he was talking about, you know. <laughs> and it's not that nothing against him, but it's just like some people can teach and some people can't. And yeah. um, teachers usually get a bad rap because they kind of go, oh, if you can't can't do, you teach, you know. I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, okay. You yeah, know? I have seen. I mean, have sometimes people get stuck where they where they teach for maybe too long, and the, the industry is constantly shifting. And um, sometimes, sometimes it can it can shift without you knowing, and then when you go try to go back into it, you're actually a lot ru- like more rusty than you thought you oh, were. Oh yeah, and that's time. all you have to be aware of. And so, if you are teaching, you should always try to I think um, keep your skills up to date, and um, you know try to take jobs and everything. And but yeah, it, it is it is a skill. I don't even think that I. I mean, it's funny to say I don't even think that I have the, the best like. Like, I don't think I could teach a class, for example. Um, I, I struggled to go through some of the books that I did. I did a lot of editing to make, my, make myself not sound uh, so dumb. But, yeah, um, it's a skill. It's a skill to, to as, I think, as you said in one of your videos, it's a skill to be able to take a very complicated thing and to break it down into very simple concepts and, and, and try to, try to like, push that out. And uh, if you can make somebody understand you, then that's a... That's a really good um, quality to have, and so, uh, I, I've had um, reviews at studios before where you know they 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 compliment they compliment you on on your ability to to share things with the team. And you're like a team player, and uh, and that also makes like a good lead is that you're able to talk to people and get points across, and um, you know explain something that's very confusing in a very simple way that people can digest, and that that, that can make for 
for some pretty good leads too. So not everybody can do it, but if you have the skill, you should definitely um tell it. I mean, hey Tony, um, we're gonna let me do one more editorial break here. I'm gonna recall you back. Um, I'm getting everything sure. you're saying. It's just it's it seems to bog down after 40 minutes, and I don't think we're gonna go another 40, probably another 30. So sure. let, let me uh, disconnect, and I'll I'll recall you back. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Let's see. And let me know if, if I'm going in to too much. Dude, uh, everything you're saying is gold. I mean, that's all I can tell you. You know, I mean, everyone loves this think... series. They just can't get enough. They're like, I got more. You know, I'm like, I'm trying. You know. Yeah, it's good. I, I was really interested in everything everybody else had to say. So I just don't want to like repeat everybody. But uh, no, yeah, I don't, I'm not seeing any repeating. Um, so what we'll do at this point is um, I'll we'll continue on with the reel and then we'll go straight in the Q and A. Um, sure, I, um, I actually bookmark this entire thing so that everyone's like, I don't want to. I just want to go to the Q and A. So there'll there'll be like bookmarks at the bottom of the YouTube oh, cool. video. So yeah. So yeah. you were saying? Oh, uh, I don't know. I was I was gonna say, are we live still? I don't know. No, yeah, not, uh, uh, we are recording now. I'm gonna edit. So let's let's start right now. Okay, so continuing on, just throughout your one thing that drives me nuts, and this is nothing against you, Tony, because you're mm -hmm. I have no no room to speak here, but I something about saturation. What's your opinion of saturation in these, all these movies, like oversaturation? Oh. Is it just stylistic, or yeah, well, um, one of the things about about reels is that you can only use the um, final film version. Uh, I mean, I guess you could do your own color correction on, on your own reel, but uh, uh, you don't get like the nice neutral graded plates you know um i knew a lot of people that that it would look absolutely amazing they were doing tv shows and they were doing everything it looked great and then like, they'd see it on tv and like they crushed all the blacks and everything was just destroyed and they were just so angry um i even uh was with my friend and, and he he like spent all this time doing this uh amazing shot and uh only and there was there was a character who had like a um, a hoodie over and you could see this like floating roto shape that was made in di that was um like <laughs> like offsetting the blacks um and as a compositor that's like you know somebody ruining your edges or something and you're like oh no so um yeah that and without the handles of a shot like the shots can be quite short it's also very annoying but uh and uh, if you notice um it says public on my demo reel because there's been some cases where I'm not allowed to show some some things um, to the public. So what I do is I just I have a private version with um, a few additional shots, and that's what I'll send to recruiters if they ask. So that's what I'll send out to the recruiters. So that's hey, something I, you have to be aware. Of. Well, what you were saying about colors was interesting because when I finally saw my uh, Sam Jackson commercial on TV, it just popped up. I'm like, oh look, there it is. And I'm like, what do they do to the blacks? How come they got red <laughs> in the in the shadows? Like, yeah. what do they do to that shot? You know, I'm like, oh my uh, goodness. Oh, you remember. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, I'm sitting there going, like, and then, you know, they got to take into account color transformations going from whatever, Rec 709 to, you know, uh, what is it, P3 or whatever. What's your opinion of HDR? Is that is that coming into play? Does that play a part? Is that even there yet? Or, um, Well, I mean, we always we always work in high dynamic range in Nuke. Like, nothing gets clamped when we work on it. Um, as, far, as far as, like, HDR, I mean, it's great, like, HDR TVs and stuff. Um, the more range, the better, because you want to approach real life as much as you can. Are you guys um, working in Asus at all, or? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, a lot of times we work in Asus. Um, yeah, for the most part, I think Asus CG and Asus. Um, some some companies have their own LUTs or like pipeline stuff. It's all it's all very like different per, depending on the studio. But um, yeah, everything you everything you work on is is uh, HDR. Like they have values of like sixteen and stuff. And, you know, it's like huge range. And obviously it, that all gets compressed when you put something on YouTube or, or, or anything like that. So Yeah, when you yeah, transform you're, you're it. To... You're always aware of the highlights. You'll never get away with a shot if you don't gain it down and gamma it up and all that stuff. Like they won't, they won't let that through the tech check process if you don't do that sort of stuff. Gotcha. The, um, let's kind of go, let's go through here. So what what's going on in this shot with the... Yeah, there was a there was a green screen in the background. Some of the buildings in the background are CG. Um, oh, like so right hard here. to tell. Yeah, like there was a green screen that went straight across your head that ended like a, a physical green screen um, in the background, and there was all this atmospherics and stuff. So it was half gray because of all the smoke. 
and then just super bright sky um, above the halfway point. And so, you know, the, what, that's one of the worst case scenarios because you see the the edge of the line moving, and so you're more likely to spot it because it's like it's like a floating rotor shape or something. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you'll see it like yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was yeah. Uh, it's, that was it's another eating one into your mat basically because of the light wrap, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if the green, if you have a still shot and the green screen is not moving, you can do a lot with that because you can just put a rotor shape and you can um, you know depending on how much the character is moving, like maybe you can do this screen for this section and this screen for that section. But where that edge is um, between the two green screen, where that key mix point is, uh, can get pretty pretty disgusting. So. Um, in that case, I think I, there was like a few, they're very picky on the details in some of these bigger films, like the, how much detail they can get out and they will just, um, A and A, B the plates. So they will go back and forth with uh, a wipe and if they are missing a hair, they'll be like, Hey, bring that hair back. Um, so I think in that case I had to like just paint in some hairs, uh, where I needed to. Um, and I think I had, I had a whole, that was one of those things I had a little like sequence of those shots. It was like four of them, and so even though you only see one of them, it's like another another like couple week process of like uh, having to go through and key all those hairs. So to paint out to paint back a hair that you can't really get a hold of and put it in there, it's sort of like a, a still frame track in and then reveal through a roto paint node. Yeah, let me. Um, I'll try to clarify. No, n- nothing I say is going to work a hundred percent of the time, <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously. But you'll have, um, like, for example, you could use an additive keyer, um, and you could key back the, the hair, but you might not need it everywhere. Maybe it completely destroys the upper half of the key or something. And so, as a result, like, that's, that's one of the problems with, with trying to do everything 100%, like, with one, like, like with one D-spill or with one... Um, key light or something like you'll need specific things for very specific edges and in, in parts of the um, screen. So you know, you could either roto it or you know. Ro- and when I'm when I say roto or key, or paint, I'm saying like you're revealing back the part that you've done that works for that specific part. So you have to think of it like puzzle pieces. Like oh, that works there. So and there's no other way to achieve it without doing yeah, this sure. there. So I'll need to like roto that soft like soft road of that section in there so that that it doesn't destroy everything and that that section gets solved so it's always like piling on specific parts and specific sections and everything what do you guys use for heat distortion if you don't mind me asking like that's one of those ones that everybody uses something different um oh, okay. it depends on the studio. um there's a lot of there's a lot of good tools on Nukipedia. um i think there was one called x distort I think that That's was a pretty story. good one. Yeah, I think it was, I can't remember his name, Xavier something. Um, but yeah, that's, that's everybody's got their own, their own tool that they use, but it's pretty important. Um, one thing that I'll mention on heat distortion is, I had to learn this, there's a part in my reel um, towards the end where it was almost like a case study because I, I was making this, uh, go, go towards the end. Yeah, this, this, um, Sorry, that this heat distortion stuff there. So they a case study where um, I had to make the shockwave entirely in nuke. Like there was no CG at all. Was, well, the the sound machine was CG, but uh, the shockwave itself was no Houdini or anything. And so uh, there was, that was like a case study for me of like how to do distortion correctly. But I think a lot of people don't know like if if you uh, plug in. Um, the UV channels into a, a distortion node. Um, if if they're if they're only positive pixels, like uh, positive green and positive red, it'll only go to screen right and and up. Oh. So everything distorted up. Distortion <laughs> like you have to you have to remember that like uh, negative red will be um, going left and positive red will be going right and uh, positive green will be going up and negative green will be going down. And so in order to get proper distortion, you'll need um, negative and positive values. So that things don't always just move in one direction. They go kind of up and down, and depending on um, what it is that you're trying to achieve. So that's pretty important. Uh, you don't, 
you don't always want to just do you don't want to clamp that um clamp you, the values yeah I mean, they're called. It's basically super whites are above one, and sub blacks are below zero, right? That's the common terminology, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for those, for those, I mean, it's at that point, it's utility paths. So everything is going to be utility passes are like um, a position world, position ref, uh, UV depth. Like you know, you'll you'll have depth that's rendered out of um, V-ray or something. That's you know, the values are like fifteen thousand because um, that was with the distance in the CG renderer. So. Something like that. Uh, cool. Well, I think at this point, I think we need to get to the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, let's go ahead and just go here. So just before we begin, uh, if you guys are interested, crea uh, creativelions.com. Um, again, he has a whole blog tutorial. Uh, again, being a giver and a, uh, a uh, uh, person that gives back to the industry and helps everybody out. I think there's anybody that hasn't been aware of his keying and all of his incredible workflows here. Um, and of course his, uh, his YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, compositor compositing mentor, um, which to me first imply that you were for a higher basis for, uh, you know, like a four higher tutor or something. I'm like, no, that's not the case. <laughs> Obviously you're too busy, <laughs> but, um, you can see, uh, Basically, I mean, we can sum it all up. Your disappearance from your YouTube channel was really just because you're too busy, right? Well, yeah. Um, I once I got the job in in London uh, from Los Angeles, I went from having like a stable job and apartment um, to uh, basically I become sort of a digital nomad. Uh, I don't like the term, but I mean it's true. It's like uh, I live out of um, a suitcase and a backpack, basically. Um, and I'll scale up. Like, uh, I don't always live at a suitcase and a backpack. Like in Sydney, I had my own furniture in my own room, but you know, I had to move and I had to sell everything and I had to move to the next place. And uh, you always keep your core stuff, but that, that's my decision. I'm, you definitely don't have to do that to be a compositor. I know a lot of compositors with um, a home base and they travel to different countries and then they go back home and they have, you know, they rent out their apartment and stuff like that. So I've, that's just what I've chosen to do. And uh, I love it. I wouldn't do it any other way. But um, you don't have to. You can you can move to Vancouver or something and set up your entire life or work from home as Hugo did. Um, it's uh, it's all up to you. It's a, it's a lot of options out there for people, I think. Do you find yourself both, uh, you know, I don't want to pry too much. You can plead the fifth on this one. But um, do you find yourself like uh, longing for like, well, you know, hey, just family or relationships or missing friendships of people that you actually work with or kind of started to, cause I noticed like VFX industry is like a big summer camp. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Hey everybody, we're here at this camp. It's a uh, camp yeah. ILM. How are you doing? Great. All right. We're out of here. You know, <laughs> sure. yeah. um, I, I think that that's like a super personal question. Like, um, they don't, I have, I haven't really had, any trouble in that sense, like, like, uh, I don't really get homesick that much, and, and, uh, and, uh, as far as relationships, like, um, that's up to the person, I guess, um, but, but, I mean, it can certainly be difficult, like, if you have a family, I can imagine it's very difficult to keep a relationship, I know a lot of people that do long distance, which, um, can end up being, you know, bad in the relationship, but, um, there's a lot of other people, I know a guy who, for example, was, um, I think he also went to full cell, and he, moved to Montreal, he found a girlfriend, and they moved together to Weta, um, to, to Wellington, and now they're, like, getting married. So there's a lot of stuff like that that you see that you will never you would never be able to do and maybe if you're stuck in one place. And as far as the, the friends, like, yes, you you always like to work with the same, uh, like, people or see them again. But um, I'd, like to, I'd like to also stress that just because you stay in one place doesn't mean other people will. So mm -hmm. if you stay in the studio uh, for a long time, people are still going to be coming and going because they have their own lives. So I think it's, it's pretty rare to have um, that type of stability where like, everyone's going to be raw, raw friends for forever. Um, and what, what I can say personally is that I've made a lot of friends and, and uh, I love everybody that I meet in the industry and it's always cool to, to meet up with them again. Um, next week I'm, I'm going to Sweden to see 
uh, a bunch of people that I met in different places in the world, uh, like when I met in Munich, when I'm in Shanghai, and when I met in London, and they're all in Stockholm right now, so I'm going to say hi to them. Uh, I mean, there's always stuff like that, which is amazing. Um, th- like you were saying before, the industry is really small, and that's some of the, sometimes the best projects are when you work with the same people again um, from other countries and other other places, and uh, and you get to see each other again and catch up and everything. So always keep connections when you can. So you're decompressing from uh, the uh, Marvel, uh, Captain Captain Marvel, right? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I probably could have. I probably could have uh, gone into another project, uh, but it's, it's still coming out of winter here in, in Germany, so it's not not the most ideal time I to think travel. You need but... I mean, just the health. I mean, it's just healthy to just decompress, you know. And... Yeah, yeah, and that was a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, the, I think I think stressful projects. As long as they end and you can, uh, you know, get this feeling of reward and like, oh, I did it. Now I can go on a on a beach or something, or 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 go home to my family, um, or or work on my side project or whatever. Yeah, it's. I think you're, you're from Massachusetts, right? I am. I'm from a small town about an hour away from Boston, a label. Oh. So yeah, uh, but I've, this time I've sort of lived everywhere. So. I've, don't At least you're not from Boston. I had four roommates from Boston. They drove me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. And it something about the movie uh, Boondock Saints. They can't stop talking about that movie. I don't know. It's like, you, you see yeah. Boondock Saints? I'm like, I know. I'm never going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I never lived in the city, so I was able to, uh, uh, I guess, avoid getting that accent. Because um, where, I, where I grew up, I think everybody just had a neutral sort of Neutral accent, so I guess I, I never never grew into that in any way before. Uh, they, well, they grew up that. in a hard part of Boston called Lions, and they were like, yeah, Lions, man, you stick your head out the window, you get punched. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rough town, I think, yeah. Uh, it's cool. That's, um, so let's uh, obviously we probably have the, at this point, we got the tapping of the finger by the people that ask questions. Uh, so, sure. um, I got one last question for myself, and that is, as far as reels, that stand out or anything, what would you say, I'd like to see more of this in reels, but less of this in reels? Hmm. Um, whenever you get a breakdown of something, uh, that's really good because you can see uh, the before and after. Um, that That's that's pretty key. Obviously, you can't get that all the time, but certainly for students. I mean, I, I know they do breakdowns already, but that's um, that can be really good. Um there's a lot, of, a lot of technical stuff that you'll, you'll want to, you, you'll want to have like one shot that's super creative and artistic and another shot that's like really technical. And so, you know, the ideal situation is uh, when you're looking at a reel, like uh, as, as a recruiter, like somebody can demonstrate that they've, um, that they worked on look dev of something and they like created this asset like completely creatively and then at the same time, the next shot is like some crazy technical thing. It's like, yeah, I had to Python script this thing, or I had to like make some crazy setup. Or, so that's like, you, you want to display all of your um, skill sets as much as you can. Um, if you, yeah, if you need, if you're a student, then maybe you'll want to pick one shot that's more on the creative side and one shot that's more on the technical side, and, and maybe you want to, to display that. Cool. Oh my God, Valentine. Bigger staff, compositing student here. I am just halfway through my first year of education. I'm beginning to put a showreel together. Any advice on what companies like to see when offering internships? Right now, I'm working as a roto. Sh- I'm working on a roto shot, but have no intention of ever becoming a roto artist. Would I focus on the things I want to do, or should I show a wide variety of skills to increase the chances of being hired? I think you should um, definitely display if you're going in as a junior. Definitely have a comp shot. Um, I think what this, what breaks away from like roto prep to comp is that comp deals with green screens and CG. At least that was that was the um, the line when I was at Luma Pictures. It was like like you could have an entire shot that was um, all prep and there was no CG. It would, it, in any studio would probably be called a comp shot because comp shots without CG are still comp shots. But um, yeah, like. If you have like CG and green screen, definitely you want to display those skills if you can. Um, but if if you don't want to get a rotor job, I don't know, like maybe 
maybe stop. If you want to move into junior comp, try to try to eliminate all the rotos in your in your um, reel as possible, so that you don't get like pigeonholed into into a, a field. Um, so so when you're when you're trying to like jump up to that gap, you gotta update the reel to kind of match that level of skill that you're trying to make before. Uh, Vortex Show. What's your opinion on artists going to train people in China for companies like Base VFX? Does your studio work with students writing their bachelor's thesis for the VFX house? It's hmm. a good question. I think um, Erwan touched upon that on his <laughs> um, on his interview. Like, there's nothing wrong with with people um, learning from you, like anywhere in the world. Like, it doesn't, shouldn't really matter. I can see I can see why people would be like scared. Maybe that you know you're training you're training your replacement or something. But if you're at a level where you can train people, you probably have nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but um. Yeah, I, I don't think that's um, I don't think that's a, a big deal. Like, um, I I didn't train people when I went to when I went to China. I mean, they they brought a bunch of uh, Westerners to come in, and we were working just on shots. So, um, I have heard some people that like go to India and train, but um, certainly they they want that out of people. Like, they want to get the most out of um, somebody, so they want to train them up so that when they're I guess when they're gone, they can still use the content. That sort of happens in every studio, though. I think, um, like, if you're really good, they'll want you to come in and, like, make everybody better, like, um, in, in that way. So, no, I don't think it's just something that people should be worried about. China has its own market. Um, there's not too many films that are being done in, in China at the moment. There's a lot of films, I think, that are being done in, in India, but not so much comp work. I think um, other people were mentioning it's still a lot of very, like, technical work so i think there is some um gap between the creative stuff and the technical stuff that places like india and china are doing um that they have to overcome over there so i I don't think it's much to worry about right now i got uh raymond doetjes uh do you produce real tangible art yourself and if so what do you find more fulfilling yeah, um, myself, I, I don't. <laughs> I spend most of my time like traveling when I'm not working, and uh, maybe I just don't have that that itch to do. I mean, I feel like a, you know, you're doing art like all day, like uh, on the computer, like when you're a compositor. And yeah, a lot of it's technical, but it's still kind of artistic. But yeah, there's certainly a lot of people that have cameras and they go out and and they go take pictures of everything, and, and they have side projects and they have whole CG forums and and everything like this. Um, so and that that's really helpful. If I've heard I've heard of you can display other skills besides uh, CG, like an artistic background or or uh, painting or skills like that. Like you, you can get a leg up on other people, I think. And if you're able to say like, oh, I have a wide range of skills. So yeah, so to each his own, I think. Cool, uh, Matthias J. Currently a 3D studio wanted, wanting to transition to comp work. So trying to get into as a 3D generalist, what are your, what are the most common 3D models to be comped in live action, everyday items, vehicles, buildings, creatures, etc. Yeah, I mean I think that depends on um, depends on the show that you're doing. Um, I think characters are pretty pretty common. Um, it's obviously very they're the, probably the most complicated because you know you need somebody to model it, rig it animate it and everything. Objects are obviously, you make an object and you throw it in and track it in. Uh, um, I think set extensions, pretty common. I do, like, there's a lot of set extensions and skills. And that could include, like, replacing the background and adding a foreground element. So, you know, stuff like that. Just, just maybe go out, shoot something, and um, try to figure out what would be cool to, to add into your, into your shot yourself. Like, oh, I could replace that, or I could, like, add this CG in the foreground and stuff. So. so two more questions left, sir, and then we could all get a bathroom break here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are from the Tech Talk. And again, for those of you watching, I have questions for Tech Talk, Real Talk, Post Your Real, uh, and also the regular Q&A question link uh, for people. But Tech Question, what is the best? This is from uh, AP Man T 12 What is the best and most proper way to regain, regrain the image? And what is the mm-hmm. best and most proper way to add grain to CG elements? Mm. 
That's a pretty good question. Um, a lot of times you will work on a denoise plate, like completely, at least in, in films and commercials and stuff. You'll you'll want to work because you don't want to keep something that's grained. Um, and also, anytime there's a camera shake, that has to be regrained completely, like with original grain, uh, or, or sorry, with your own grain on top, because you can't keep the original grain of that one. Um, anytime there's a reposition, like if, it, if it's moving or, or scaled up at all, like you'll need to replace the grain. Um, let's say it's just a normal shot and it doesn't have, it doesn't have anything like that. Um, yeah, you can, you can um, denoise the, the plate and then minus the denoise from the uh, original, and that'll create like a positive and negative value grain. And then what you, what you can do is um, add that back at the very bottom of your comp and only regrain what's necessary. So the CG, for example, and uh, how would you grain the CG? Um, there's different ways to do it. There's a lot of good grains out there on Wikipedia and everything. Just um, go per channel, match what you can. There's a, there's a really cool uh, tool called DAS, DAS regrain. So from a guy here in Germany, uh, it's on Wikipedia. Um, that that's a really good uh, tool that I was uh, investigating recently, and um, it, it's good because it lets you think about how to regrain something, even if you don't even use it. Like how somebody would think about regraining, but essentially, you'll want to keep the original place grain um, on places where you're not replacing anything or the background hasn't changed. And you'll want to only use the synthetic grain or whatever you're, you're regraining only on the parts where you'll need to. So if you if you have a roto prep uh, and you only patch one thing, like you're not going to regrain the entire plate. You're going to try to regrain just that patch, because like, um, you can lose detail, and that that can be a no no in uh, when somebody's tech checking. So you can just, I mean, do you guys use Neat Video for the degrain? Yeah, that's a really industry standard okay. plugin. Um, I think, I mean, you can just use the Nuke Denoiser, I think, if you have no alternative. But um, I think that's, it's pretty it's pretty cheap, actually. I think it's like 100, 100 I think it's 40 three, bucks. 300 bucks, if I'm not mistaken. Is but it? that's it. You I get it. I mean, you get one, that's all you got to buy, you know. I think they have, like, a floating license and a, a node lock license. Uh, it's, it'd probably be worth it, like, if you were starting your own studio or something. <laughs> definitely recommend it. Uh, he also has another question here. He has a lot of questions, this guy. Uh, <laughs> so don't Go get angry it. at Monty. I, I'm not going to be able to get them all here. Uh, um, what is the best and most proper way to deal with motion blur on green screen footage? How do you maintain detailed motion blur areas when you're working with green screen footage? Let's go one at a time. So... so What's the best way to what? What to is the best and most proper way to deal with motion blur on green screen footage? Ah, that's always a tough one, huh? Um, Don't shoot it in motion blur. Like have the shutter speed. <laughs> no, then, no, no. You want that, oh. you want that nice blur. <laughs> or at least um, get some synthetic motion blur in post via vectors. Or I don't know. I mean, if it gets too crazy. No, no. You'll have to. You'll have to go in and probably treat the the good the one of the good things about motion blur is it's very forgiving because it only lasts for like a frame or two mm -hmm. and so that's where you'll need to go in and like treat that one thing like to re reveal that d spill or that key that only works in that one spot or that that edge treatment or whatever and you'll just kind of like quickly paint it over um but uh or you can uh, Sometimes you'll have to use a solid color, but the, one of the problems is that if you have a, in the case of Roto in a character, if you have like a moving hand, you'll see the background through the hand, and you need to re either replace it, or you'll need to blur it, or you'll need to like edit in the color. Uh, I remember work, when I was working on uh, at Luma at um, the first Avengers, uh, sorry, that Captain America, the first Avengers, they they had to. Uh, make CG arms for um, Chris Evans because he was running and there was so much motion blur and we had to replace the background that they actually like rendered out his hands because that was the only way to like wow. get detail back. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, but there's a lot of like 2D stuff you can do, I think. But but yeah, you, you'll need to do some fancy stuff. But you got to use every tool in your toolbox at that point. And um, luckily, it doesn't. It's like a quick two frame thing so you can you can like do things that only last for one frame you know 
Like if you if you have to like paint the motion blur claim and it's like only for that frame, you have to paint it 100 percent by yourself. Then um, at least you can use it. So. How do you? I, mean, um, I was just wondering because I've noticed this: if if you shoot a bright green screen uh, background with an actor and then you uh, go in for the de spill work on the edge. If the comp, the, the background that you're eventually going to comp the character behind is very, very dark, you're going to have to really yeah. pull down the almost into negative values to 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 pull out all that luminance data that's in the motion blurred and areas. Mm -hmm. Is there any workaround for that 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 works well with you tools or anything like that? Probably the probably the hardest um, one of the hardest ones. Um, okay, well, one of the well, a quick tip that I could give is um, if you have your if you have your edge that's that's comped and it's looking a bit uh, weird um, as you're getting an edge. What you could do is you could blur the two together and then use a min operation and that'll either take the min of like the blurred combination uh, and then you combine that with the edge. So it's kind of like you know, it won't go lower than the, the minimum that's already there oh, okay. because it's like lighter and bl lighter. If they give you the, the wrong tech check, they're like, Hey, this edge looks like crap. Do it again. Then you might have to like redo everything. So like frame and so is this like a broken. Gestapo that comes along uh, uh, outside of your art director or whatever director is uh, in charge of you that kind of walks around say tech check? You know, almost like an audit from the IRS or something. I mean, um, the, the dread of every composite is a tech check. Um, no, it's it's it all depends on who your supervisor is, and that's very company specific and that's very supervisor specific. But um, I mean sometimes. You'll, you'll be left to do the check check on your own and other times it'll go to check check. So what usually happens is the shot will be creatively finaled and that means like the studio will say this shot looks great, um, just fix it so that it doesn't have any errors and then it goes to the tech check realm and then somebody looks at it and they'll go through it with a fine tooth comb, you know. They'll go through every channel, they'll gain it up, they'll gamma it up, they'll play it backwards, they'll flip it, uh, stuff like that and uh, oversaturated and uh, just go through it in real fine tooth comb and you know the it depends on the person but yeah sometimes they'll see just like a little line and they'll be like yep that's not going to go through and you have to understand it as well like it's up to it's up to them they're the net so if something goes through them it could be blamed on because it's ultimately it's on their shoulders because they're the supervisor um so they, they don't want anything to go by but yeah, that can be pretty frustrating sometimes because those are a lot of the notes that make you kind of stay late um, mm. past your hours because you don't exactly know a tech check. You know, it could be a quick fix or it could be two days of work. You don't actually know. It's not really tangible, so it depends. Yeah. Mm. Uh, last question here from Vladislav Enchin. Uh, what's the most efficient way to remove wires in complex shots where everything moves, camera subject, wire moves in front of subject, and is very difficult to get the proper tracking data to stick a clean patch? Mm. Well, I think um, this is where I learned a lot from uh, my supervisor at Luma Pictures, uh, Glenn Morris. Shout out to Glenn if he's watching this. Um, you can be very overwhelmed when you have stuff to clean up. Uh, it's it can be super overwhelming, uh, especially if you have wires crossing over different depths and you need to reproject stuff and then it goes over a tree and then it goes over somebody's face and it's all motion blurred or whatever. Um, you have to break things up into absolutely the tiniest pieces that you can. Um, so what you want to do is you want to you want to figure out what works those frames that you need like say it goes over the guy's shirt a wire goes over somebody's shirt then you can you know do a get the frame before the wire goes over the shirt you can frame hold it or clean plate it and then replace it for when the wire goes over and then turn that patch off when you need to and then you can do that for the background maybe you'll need to do a projection setup if you have a tree maybe you'll need to you know recreate the tree or, or 2d track a tree in, and then shut it up like as soon as you don't need it anymore try to go back to the original plate um, and as you do each step, as you put all the puzzle pieces, it'll get, it'll get less and less daunting. And from what you began with, with the thing, like you didn't even know how to begin with it. At least you knew like, oh, I can, I can do that one little part there. And then, and then later on, it's just cleaning up. I mean, once, once you're 90% there, it's like, yeah, maybe you'll have to clean, like maybe you'll have to actually paint a few frames. Um, but 
I think this is getting the snowball moving is definitely uh, important and looking at everything. How can you fix this one little part? How, don't try to like replace the entire thing. Try to go back to the original plate as much as you can. Cool. Um, you know, I, last thing I can think of is we really didn't talk too much about Captain Marvel. Um, anything you want to share before we kind of end cap this or? Um, no, I think it should. I just finished it. It looked, looked like it was going to be another Marvel movie. Like, uh, it's got some cool cool effects in it, I think. Um, I think Trickster worked a lot on the the cat, which I, I've heard is really well received. So, and uh, we got like a, a compliment of the, the the director like couldn't tell which was a real cat and which was a fake cat anymore because I think they used Digi Double for cat and real cat. So that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, let's go see it if you want. Um, should be cool. Cool. Um, awesome. Um, so. Uh... I think that's pretty much it. Thanks a bunch for coming out. Really appreciate uh, your feedback. It's great to hear someone of your stature like watching my videos. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. Let me know if I'm doing anything wrong. Again, I'm like I said before. I'm trying to uh, being stuck on Desert Island, Chicago here, trying to find work on the outside here to learn and then reteach it. Um, yeah. At the same it's time, great work. It's, uh, it really caught my attention. <laughs> And uh, I think you're doing great. I think uh, it's a big help to the community, I'm sure, and I'm, I'm not the only one that thinks that. And uh, thanks for the time and for inviting me out to talk. Cool. Well, thank you, sir, and I'll, hopefully we'll have you back again for some more tech talk. Yeah, sure. Anytime you want, yep. All right.